Okay, I think we can get started here. Um, <clears throat> it's a good feeling when you're running a minute or two late and you, you see your co-chair is running a minute or two, so you know the meeting can't start without you. So I'm going to call to order the regular meeting of the Learning and Teaching Committee for Monday, April 19th, 2021 for Community Unit School District 303, and the time is 5.02. <clears throat> and we can start with citizen comments. And we have one citizen comment, Christine Warren, and that's for a recognition. Good evening. Um, actually, I'd like to um, introduce um, Stephanie Dodd, who's going to honor one of her art students. Hello, my name is Stephanie Dodd, and I am one of the photography teachers over at St. Charles North High School. And I would like to call up uh, my student, Natalie Lamb. As you can see, Natalie has a lovely, large silver medal hanging around her neck. She was actually the recipient of a national silver medal um, from the Scholastic Art Awards. You can see the photo um, up here on the screen. She uh, took this photo in my class first semester. Um, it was one of our projects. Um, I recognized it as being a very wonderful uh, creation of artwork. And I highly encouraged her um, at the end of the semester to submit this to the Scholastic Art Awards. If you're unfamiliar with the Scholastic Art Awards, it is a national competition. Um, it starts with a regional judging. So she, it was sent to judging for the um, Chicago suburbs where it won a gold key. After it won the gold key, it was then sent to national judging. And then we found out about six weeks later that she had won a national gold medal, or sorry, a national silver medal. Uh, that puts her in the top 1% of art students in the entire country. So this is an amazing accomplishment. Very few students um, are able to receive this award. So I would just like everybody to give a nice round of applause to Natalie for this. And I would just like to say thank you to the board because Natalie is a full remote student. And with the technology that, we were, that the school board or the school was able to provide, Natalie was able to access all of the programs that she needed. I was able to run the curriculum as it was, even if it was a normal school year. So she was still able to create the same high quality of work that we have been doing for many years. So thank you very much. Can I ask a quick question? Is, uh, is that, am I kind of loud here? I think I'm too close. Um, now, is that picture taken at home or in the school? In the school? Um, it was taken at home in my bathroom. No, it's, it's, I, I don't know. They always say I don't know art, but I know what I like. That's, that's really, I, I can recognize that as something. I have a couple artists in my family, so I, I can recognize some things. I have no ability myself, but. Yeah, the picture is of my brother. So, yeah. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> well, he should probably stand up too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Does anybody else have any? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we should move on to our four discussion items. So the first item up for discussion is the K2, K through two phonics resource. We're quite a group, so we're gonna try and organize ourselves a little bit so that it's easy for us to share our microphone and um, present information to you tonight. 
right, so good evening. Um, I'm Patty Palaji. I'm the Director of Instructional Interventions. Um, and I want to thank you for the opportunity to share the work of our K2 Phonics Curriculum Development Team. This work is a true measure of the collective efforts of our learning and teaching team. A variety of perspectives joined together to delve into research, analyze data, and review available resources. We engaged in collective learning, which deemed our commitment to this important work. Um, and we would just ask that this evening, as we go through our presentation, if you could save your questions to the end and we'll do our best to answer all of them. The work of the K2 Phonics CDT is aligned with several board policies. The ultimate goal of our CDT was to identify the collective needs and potential resources to ensure the systematic delivery of phonics instruction to every K2 student. During our presentation, information on our process will, and our decision making will be shared. The K2 Phonics CDT's work is also aligned with our district strategic commitments. Our work recognizes the importance of systematic phonics instruction as a component of foundational literacy. As you will learn later in the presentation, our plan also includes an emphasis on the professional learning needs of our staff. Thank you again for this time this evening, and I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Christine Warren, who will introduce you to our team. Thank you, Dr. Pawaji. Um, as you can see, as Dr. Pawaji mentioned, we have quite a team behind us. And so actually, if everybody could hear, would it be okay if I had them stand um, and introduce themselves? Hello, my name is Megan Martin and I'm the lead speech language pathologist for the district. Hi, I'm Holly Crossan and I'm a kindergarten teacher at Munhall. Hi, I'm Karen Pratt instructional interventions coordinator and lead school psychologist for the district. I'm Kim Ripperger, reading specialist at Anderson, teaching first grade remote this year. Hi, and I'm Becky Jordahl. I'm a second grade teacher at Munn Hall this year, but usually a reading specialist. And as you can see on the screen in front of you, there are several members um, of the CDT who aren't here this evening, um, but we want to thank them for all of their time and hard work. Without them, this work wouldn't be possible. Um, we had a lot of really in-depth conversations um, about the science of reading and what that looks like in District 303, and so we're excited to have this presentation for you this evening. Good evening. My name is Karen Pratt, Instructional Interventions Coordinator and Lead School Psychologist in D303. This is my 11th year and I facilitated the CDT process as part of my administrative internship, which I will complete in the fall of 2021. Doctors Palaji and Warren saw this work as a leadership opportunity for me to weave together my current role and previous experience in D303, supporting literacy instruction and students with reading disabilities. Liter literacy development has long been an area of interest of mine as a school psychologist, and I'm excited to share our team's work with you tonight as we develop a plan to support foundational literacy skill development for all students in D303. Our curriculum development team identified two main purposes for our work. First, to explore and recommend a phonics instructional resource for all K-2 classrooms for the 2021-2022 school year. Second, to develop an implementation plan for the selected phonics instructional resource. These two purposes laid the foundation of our work which aims to support early literacy skill development in all K-2 students in D303. I want to share with you some of the rationale behind our team's curriculum development work in the area of phonics. D303 student data as related to early literacy skill has shown a need for direct explicit phonics instruction. This need has been recognized across the district through data team meetings, problem solving meetings, and district level data analysis. This school year, students completed the iReady Diagnostic Assessment to gather information on early literacy skills. In kindergarten, first and second grades, between 31 and 43% of D303 students are considered one or more years behind in their phonics skills at winter benchmark based on this assessment. These data speak to the need for direct, explicit instruction in early literacy skills to increase overall reading achievement in grades K through two. 
The need for phonics instruction is not exclusive to this year's student data. The graph above demonstrates the need from last school year during the winter of 2019 benchmark. Students in kindergarten and first grade completed the FastBridge Early Literacy Composite to measure early literacy skills. As identified through MTSS criteria, 80% or more of D303 students should be within the green bars. Our combined percentages were below this benchmark. Also, the number of students identified in yellow, tier two, and red, tier three bars, exceed the number of students who can participate effectively in tiered interventions and supports. And from fall to winter, fewer students are meeting or exceeding early literacy benchmarks, and more students are evidencing the need for tiered intervention services. Over the next two years, our CDT will continue to monitor and track district level data in the domain of phonics to inform the effectiveness of our work. We will continue to monitor the percentage of students meeting grade level expectation in phonics, as well as our percentages of students evidencing a need for tiered intervention services. Our goal is that this resource increases student achievement in foundational reading skills and prevents students from needing reading intervention in the primary grades and at later grade levels. Another reason for our team's work was in response to the ISBE Dyslexia Guide, developed and adopted by ISBE in July of 2019. The Dyslexia Guide provides non-regulatory guidance to school districts in regards to preventing, identifying, and treating word-level reading difficulties in students. The work of our team centered around the prevention recommendations outlined in the guide. What instruction could we provide to all students to increase word-level reading skills and to decrease the need for tiered intervention and potential special education services. This slide represents an overview of our team's timeline. The phonics CDT work was initiated in response to a need identified by the larger ELA CDT, which met from 2017 to 2019. In the fall of 2019, our CDT began, began work on this action step with the end goal of identifying and implementing a phonics resource for grades K through two. We met monthly at first, then more frequently as our work progressed. Unfortunately, our work was interrupted by school closures in the spring of 2020, but was restarted in the fall. In January and February of 2021, we completed in-depth evaluations of potential resources, ultimately reaching unanimous consensus in March of 2021. After consensus, our team divided into small groups to begin planning. One group outlined a professional development plan for our research. We plan to provide professional development opportunities for staff in a variety of ways, through virtual options, workshops, and ongoing professional learning. Providing several options and choices for professional learning will support the ongoing implementation of our resource. Throughout our process, our team engaged in activities and discussions to inform our resource selection. First, we engaged in professional learning surrounding the science of reading, reading research, and instructional methodology. Next, our team explored an evidence-based rubric for evaluating reading curricula from Florida State University and modified the rubric to align with our CDT purpose of phonics instruction. Then, we engaged in a thorough review of our top three resources. The following slides outline some of our professional learning regarding the science of reading in which our team engaged. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Megan Martin, lead speech language pathologist, to share this information with you. As part of our deep dive into reading science, we look to the simple view of reading. In 1986, two reading researchers, Dr. Philip Goff and Dr. Bill Tumner, proposed an easy way to understand the complex combination of skills that result in reading. They called it the simple view of reading, and it answers the question, when you are presented with a passage of text, how do you extract meaning from it? You need to convert written words into speech, and you need to understand that speech. To be a skilled reader with comprehension, we need to have language comprehension and word decoding skills. Units of study provides a starting point for building language comprehension, but the simple view teaches us that we need both components. That's why it's a multiplication, not addition problem. Reading equals the product of decoding and linguistic comprehension. 
The simple view of reading stresses, if you can't decode the symbols in a sentence, you can't read it, even if you know the language in which it's written. The reading rope was created by Dr. Hollis Scarborough to capture the essence of learning to read. It is essentially an enhanced view of the simple view of reading and details critical skills required for skilled reading. The genesis of the rope dates back to Dr. Scarborough, Scarborough's talks with parents on the complexities involved in learning to read. Originally, she smoked, spoke of skilled reading as resembling the strands of a rope, and she often used pipe cleaners um, to illustrate the interconnectedness and interdependence of all the components when she was talking with parents. You can see that the reading rope consists of lower and upper strands, the word recognition strand, phonological awareness, decoding, and sight recognition of familiar words work together as the reader becomes accurate, fluent, and increasingly automatic with decoding text. Concurrently, the language comprehension strand, background knowledge, vocabulary, language structures, and verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge reinforce one another and then weave together with the word recognition strand to produce a skilled reader. These strands essentially braid together to create fluent execution and coordination of word recognition and text comprehension. In other words, skilled reading. This of course does not happen overnight. It requires explicit instruction and practice over time. That's why it is so important to get decoding going early so that students can build on their language skills. Now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Holly Crossan, a kindergarten teacher at Munn Hall to share more on our phonics process in D303. We identified eight different resources for phonics instruction. We then used the rubric from Florida State University. The rubric was modified by our CDT to focus in on our phonics needs. Here are the eight different resources we reviewed. We spent time looking through each resource carefully and scoring them on a rubric. The rubric included scores for phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, phonics, fluency, and writing. Phonics was the biggest section of our rubric where we looked at nine different components, including how explicit and sequential phonics was taught, the progression of skills, high frequency words, and decoding both in isolation and within decodable text. We then compiled the rubric scores and determined that 95 phonics core program, really great reading and foundations scored the highest. Next, we dive deeper into these resources. We went, met with representatives from the companies, and then we gauged, engaged in discussions surrounding fit. How does this align to the units of study in our current word study scope and sequence? Supports. What professional development is available? Will the recommended time allocation realistically fit into our school schedule? Usability. What hands-on materials are provided? How does this resource use a consistent instructional routine? What is the reading and writing connection? And capacity, what materials are provided for the teacher? What would teachers need to create or develop to implement the program? Looking at each resource carefully, we saw one that stood out above the rest. We were able to reach a unanimous consensus. 95 Phonics Core met the needs that we were looking for. I would like to now introduce Kim Ripperger who will share more details with you about 95 Phonics Core. This program is a whole class program for students in kindergarten through second grade. That's when I say the question. It is written to fit into our tier one reading block with 20 minutes of daily instruction. This phon phonics program is explicit and systematic, which is essential for structured literacy. The program is not only systematic and explicit, it also includes daily hands-on and engaging activities. Each student will receive their own set of manipulatives and workbooks. This program was written to be used in conjunction with any reading program, with the intention of filling the word recognition gap on the reading rope. This program includes an extensive presentation file for teachers to display in class or in the virtual setting for instruction. It is web-based and can be used and can be used on any device.
This program contains all of the necessary materials for a teacher to begin implementation with ease. It includes three teacher's manuals, four student workbooks, and sound spelling cards for each grade level. The workbooks and presentation files also support remote learning should we ever need to utilize this resource remotely. The student kits are organized in a way to ensure easy transitions in the classroom. Each kit comes in a zippered bag that contains both manipulatives and workbooks. This ensures that student materials are organized and easily accessible in the classroom and can be transitioned home in case of the remote instruction. So this was the component of the resource, resource we were all very excited about, the sound spelling cards. So here's an up close look at the card details. Um, and these details make the speech language pathologist in me very happy as it is critical that educators are pronouncing sounds correctly. What can happen if sounds are not pronounced correctly is the addition of a vowel to that sound production. So you may hear ma instead of mm. When, vowel, when sounds are produced incorrectly, it impacts the student's ability to segment the sounds in words and spell sounds correctly. These cards detail for teachers how to accurately pronounce the sounds and how to accurately, and how to teach that accurate production to the students using explicit routines that go through place, manner, and voicing of each sound. For example, today we're gonna learn about the mm sound and the letter that spells that sound. Look at my mouth when I make the mm sound. Um, my mouth is closed with my lips tight. The air comes through my nose. I cannot make the mm sound if I plug my nose. I put my hand on my throat, mm, and I feel a vibration. So mm is a voice sound. Listen again, mm. This sound can be stretched. It is a continuous sound. These teaching cues help make an abstract concept like a sound or phoneme more concrete by giving students more ways to conceptualize that sound. This is especially important in a time where we're all wearing masks um, and you can't see my mouth. So I'm gonna tell you about it. So now I would like to turn over to my colleague, Becky Jordal, reading specialist and second grade teacher at Munhall. And I just wanna do the mm sound too. Um, so as Kim already mentioned, um, in case we have remote learning again, this resource is highly adaptable um, if we have more remote days in the future. Teachers would only have to send three things home, the student workbook, the student chip set, and then the printed out parent instructions, which would make it really easy to transition if we needed to. Benefits of the resource. This resource has direct explicit instruction in addressing all of the Common Core foundational standards per grade level. It can be integrated with any core reading or writing curriculum. Our literacy blocks range between 90 and 120 minutes in our K2 classrooms. So this phonics resource would use only 20 minutes of that literacy block, leaving the rest of the lit block for phonemic awareness, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension instruction. Our CDT identify that the direct, explicit instruction and consistent instructional routines would support teachers in implementing this instruction with fidelity for all kids K2. I actually have had the privilege of field testing this resource for almost 12 weeks in my second grade classroom and seeing how my second graders are now transferring what we're doing <clears throat> when we are in our reading workshop time or our writing time whether it's decoding or encoding is so exciting to see. It's only 20 minutes of explicit instruction a day in that phonics period, but I see the work trickling across the entire day and the language they're using spilling over into their writing about how to break a word into syllables to be able to spell that better or when they're reading and come to a word they're unfamiliar with, how to break that apart. So it's just been really exciting to see the work in just a short period of time in my second graders. Now, um, though this core phonics program is relatively new, there is outcome data from program implementation and it looks very promising. The data presented on this slide represents the number of kindergarten and first grade students meeting early literacy targets at the fall benchmark as represented by the light green bars and winter benchmark as represented by the dark green bars. This school district in Pennsylvania 
saw a significant increase in the percentage of students meeting early literacy benchmarks after only a few months of implementing 95 core phonics program. We anticipate similar increases in our D303 early literacy data. CDT next steps. Now, as a team, we've already started a list of our next steps should we move forward with adapting this resource. We still needed to select a resource for grades three through five and determine how to support students in early childhood. We will need to determine which supporting resources are needed, including decodable text and classroom visuals. Another task we'll need to focus on is the alignment of this resource with units of study and our current district assessments. We plan to work with the MTSS committee to determine alignment with phonics interventions and enrichment activities. Another step to take is developing a pacing guide for teachers to use. We will also propose a first year implementation plan that Dr. Christine Warren will now share. Thank you, Becky. Megan, Martin, and I were fortunate enough to meet with 95% group and personalize our professional learning plan for District 303. The professional plan outlined in the quote provides targeted professional learning to different groups within our district. Prior to the end of the school year, administrators and CDT members will participate in a two-hour virtual training session. The CDT felt it was important to focus on building capacity within our district team in an effort to provide ongoing coaching and support throughout implementation. Our reading specialists, speech language pathologists, ISCs, psychologists, and EL teachers will engage in an in-depth training of core phonics and the science of reading and how they are intertwined. If approved, we'll work with both building and district leaders to utilize our SIP days for grade level specific training. This is in addition to the one hour training available to staff at any time prior to the start of the year. We'd like to provide ongoing coaching and support to our teachers, specialists, and administrators by grade level three times a year. These coaching sessions will include feedback and utilization of the walkthrough document with building leadership teams. In addition, we'll have full access to those coaches should any questions arise at any time. We're also shifting the teacher on special assignment position from curriculum development to an implementation specialist to support our new ELA and social studies resources and curriculum as well as phonics. The cost of the program for its first year of implementation is $189,888.60. The customized professional learning plan is $105,270. Altogether for the total for our first year is $295,158.60. The cost to sustain this program will be $65 per teacher plus student workbooks. We are asking that 95 Phonics Core Program and the outline professional learning presented this evening be included for consent at the next regular school board meeting. And again, I just wanna highlight the wonderful work of the team sitting behind me. Um, I learned a lot from them. Um, and so I hope um, they're here to answer any questions that you have. All right, I think we're better now. Okay, so well, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I learned a few things myself, so why don't we, I think the last time we started over here, so why don't we start on this side of the table here? That's why I moved on this side of the table. <laughs> Bravo. Um, it is so wonderful to see all of you. I think I know all of you. And um, Dr. Pearson, this will be the Dr. Pelagi um, legacy uh, curriculum. Um, this was work that she has wanted this district to focus on for some time. Um, you answered many of my questions and I'm very excited and I could spend hours with K2 people talking about reading and just so you know, I was a language experience teacher. So phonics was not one of my strengths as a teacher. So as I've um, grown and learned, research changes, uh, pedagogy changes, we learn more about what we have to do and clearly phonics is a is a skill that kids have to have in order to do the work. 
um, to be able to read. I love the rope. Um, it also demonstrates clearly that teaching kids to read is not a simple, um, it's not something that you just put a resource in front of a grown up and say, teach the kids how to read. You have to know quite a bit. I love that the reading specialists, classroom teachers, and speech therapists are all working together because that also shows how um, important those uh, perspectives are to the work. Um, I was a little wondering, I was wondering why you didn't choose the Lucy Calkins, um, since that's also part of our resources, but it's clear that you have looked at how this will fit together with whatever resource we have. I wondered, are we taking anything out of the reading instruction in order to add this in? Um, just one more thing to a teacher's plate, but um, Becky, you also talked about how it does fit into your writing and reading workshops. I just wondered if there was something that, I, see, I'll show my age. Are we still doing Haggerty? Okay. Does, use my teacher voice. <laughs> um, we were looking to see if there was a phonics resource that also had that phonemic awareness piece and none of them had the depth of what Haggerty does. So we still, you know, we, we, with all those rubrics, we tried to see if um, there was one that had it. Now all of them do a little review and a warm up, and this program does that, that every day um, you are doing one piece. Today my students were substituting the middle sound, so if I give you the word Stopping, let's change the for d, you want to be a terrible word. Okay, I can't think of one off the top. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, so we're doing a little two minute warm up, but Hagerty would still need to be there. Okay. So um, I think because we have 90 to 120 minutes, depending on the K2 classroom, it's worked fine for me. Um, and then when you see the payout, the amount that we are doing, kicking off our science unit today, and the kids are like, wait, look at the R control words, and this, there's an R vowel team, and they have the gestures. So the fact that they're thinking about that to the code words across the day, even though it's 20 minutes of explicit instruction, what they're doing across the day. So I don't think it's, teachers already have a word study block regardless. And okay. so they've been trying to figure out how to best meet those phonics needs. So now to have something to follow this, Okay, great, great. I wondered about kids who already come in with those skills. Is this um, a whole class experience and how do you plan to differentiate or is the program flexible enough for kids who are already that far along? Okay, and enrichment is something that our, um, our team definitely looked at and wanted to um, and just in kind of my experience with the DOD as I'm looking at this program, we do have students who come in as very strong leaders um, who, who know words right off the bat and are reading about their level. Um, where we still sometimes see difficulty is with writing or with encoding. So even if they come in as really good readers, all students still need practice in phonics skills to ensure that they are also equally as good writers, especially as they get into the intermediate and middle school. Um, so this is a program, yes, it's for all students for those 20 minutes. Um, and even if students already know it, they still have ample opportunities to practice within their writing as well. And so then my next question was about the three to five resource. Um, I assume it looks different. Um, and I'd be, we don't have to talk about it now. I just wondered how, if, if that is, is an absolute or, are, you know, a follow up to it. Sure, so our, um, our team focused on K through two for this work. Um, 95 core phonics is in the process or is telling us they're in the process of developing three to five. Um, so that certainly could be something that our group can say as we move forward. Um, will you bring us the data um, along the way so we can see, I think this, I, I agree with you. I, explicit instruction is going to make a difference in this area, skilled area, and that we should see a, a significant change. I love that you're going to um, do the training with the administration. I think um, many many people do not, even, even first grade teachers, 
don't have all the skills for teaching to read and it's important that they all have the sense of what we're doing. Thank you so much for your hard work. It's great to see you all and our kids are in good hands. So thank you for what you've done. Over here, anybody? Ms. Parker? Um, so is the 20 minutes that'll be spent in, in, in the phonics program, is it an increase of time or was that the same amount of time as before uh, where phonics was focused so on? It has been an expectation that teachers are teaching phonics, except they haven't had a resource. So teachers are trying, Becky and I have taught the word study course multiple times, and we're trying to teach teachers how to, these are the patterns that we want you to teach. This is kind of the scope and sequence. Now create your own program. So they've been under the um, guidelines that they need to be teaching it, except for now we are going to provide something for them. So instead of adding to teachers' plates, which often happens with navigating a new curriculum, we really feel like this is going to take something off of their plates because it is so easy to follow and well written that teachers should feel at ease to, to implement this program and within the time frame that they've already been using. Thank you. Um, I, one, one slide that I noticed um, was the slide that had the, the tiers um, on it. And I noticed that the tiers two and tiers three, um, uh, the percentages were quite high in those tiers. Um, and seemingly might exceed resources, um, and meaning how many people need to be involved in supporting those students. Um, how are we going to, uh, I guess, come up with a plan for that? Is that you know coming soon, or um, are there is that in the works? When, when we look at our data, yes, you're right. There are more students needing in need of intervention resources at this time than. Um, 95% for chronic, or 95% students actually made their name through their intervention resources. So their programs and, I can't tell. Um, their, their intervention programs are highly research and evidence-based and so very good results. Um, so in our next step, that could be something for consideration. We also found some other programs um, such as this that would be really great resources as well in terms of intervention. Um, so in this whole phonics plan, we do have a next step of looking at some of these interventions to support the students as well. I was also thinking about people in time. Um, is it, you know, do, do the people who are providing the interventions, do, do they have enough time to be able to, um, you know, work with all of those students? Um, I guess that's the question I'm thinking in my head. Is there something that needs to be done differently? Um, so one highlight to this program, as Karen said, is that it does have a uh, tier two, tier three intervention resource. And classroom teachers do provide interventions often alongside with reading specialists and other specialists. So if we were able to um, also get the intervention materials, we would be able to have classroom teachers familiar with their tier one resource and then with ease, hopefully um, also provide tier two interventions, which would open up specialists to be able to work with tier three students with the other program that we were also looking at, which is called SIPS. So with having a systematic and explicit resource for teachers to use, which in my 10 years in the district, this will be the first time we, we are anticipating that our numbers at tier one will increase when students have this level of instruction. And so our need for intervention should decrease. So that is ultimately our hope and our goal. And so that'll be the data that we'll continue to collect and, and be looking to have happen, to have that tier one um, graph go up. Thank you. Mr. Lackey, any questions? So you shared um, some data from a single school in Pennsylvania. How confident are you that the positive impact shown there will be replicated here? And if the um, increase in the movement of kids into tier one is one of the positive outcomes that we expect, how have other users of this tool set shown their movements towards tier one or moved their student populations toward tier one? The data on this particular resource, because it's fairly new, is fresh. So I don't, I don't personally have answers to that. 
um, I could tell you that our ultimate goal um, for our K2 friends is to give them these foundational skills that they can build upon. I, I like to say that like we certainly are teaching kids to be readers, but our main goal is that they can open up a chemistry textbook when they're a sophomore in college and be able to read any word that's in there. So it's a long term goal, um, but we have to start with these foundational skills. So a uh, follow up question to that regard is, um, how does this program impact English language learners and how will we use it there? Um, so for our English language learners, it's most important and critical that they have direct explicit instruction in English phonics skills. Um, they have, you know, they really need time and strength to transition comprehension, like we saw in the control E. And so the stronger they can be with the coding skills, the better um, our whole instruction will be for all their students. I have, a, I have a couple more, if that's okay. Oh, thanks. Go to um, it. That's what we're here for. It's, a, it's about $300,000 worth of investment. What was the uh, cost for a similar program from really great reading or foundations? Unfortunately, I don't have that information with me, but I do have some emails that I'd be happy to share what the cost of those programs were. So I think I think the uh, the follow up question to that is I recognize the unanimity of your position here and I appreciate that and it shows it reflects that that you've worked collaboratively and well and I appreciate that. At the same time, I'd really like to understand the relative difference of this program as the first place provider at $300,000 versus the second place provider and how big a price gap there is. Because what we're really talking about if I look at your process is that there are three that were likely acceptable and we have a price for one and i'd just like to understand how much better this is than the next best one and how much we have to pay to get that versus the second best um, <clears throat> when we looked at the three uh, foundations we realized it was going to be a lot harder for teachers to implement it wasn't a pick up and here's the script and you saw those sound cards of how easy it explains exactly what you need to do so we are building and deepening teachers' understanding of those skills, and foundations took a lot more to be trained and ready to just implement. And with what we know is on our um, primary teachers with rolling out new reading and writing curriculum, it's, we all agreed that that would be too hard to ask that for rollout also. Um, really great reading, one of the big de deciding factors, and correct me if I'm misspeaking, it did not have the quality of decodable text included in the program so kids could practice reading text with that built in. The nice thing that 95% group has is a nonfiction and fiction text that the kids go back to every day and are practicing reading and using their decoding skills for whatever that strategy is that they're working on. So that was a big um, difference between those two. And the other big piece when we're looking at an effective phonics lesson and the components it should have is it should have a daily writing piece. And really great reading did not have a daily writing component, which we see when you want that transfer from reading to writing, that was essential. So there were some, some big deciding factors between the three. And while it's not, it hasn't been around for long as a core program, uh, I taught in a district uh, years ago, where we implemented the 95% group tier two and tier three resources. And we were in a school that was on academic warning for the state, the state was coming in to close us. And this was the program that turned around our data. Um, I taught in Bellwood for years. And so to see that the interventions work and are tried and true, and we had <clears throat> my entire class was tier two or tier three, and every kid made growth. So I see that it works. Um, so I'm really excited about a core program to bring to St. Charles. Ms. Fergie? Okay, I just have one or two that kind of um, follow up with, uh, with some of what was already asked. I was wondering about the, I know the, uh, the Lucy Calkins was something we, we put in, I think it was about four years ago. Yeah. Two, was it just two years ago? Okay. Yep. I, I recall having the discussion about it. And when I saw that, so, we are still going to be using something from that program and this is just going to work with it 
because when I saw that name up there on the list, I, I too was wondering why it would seem that would dovetail best. Is there something about that program that, that didn't make it mesh with, with what we're doing? So I can speak anecdotally to the school that I was previously teaching at. Um, we had taken units of study phonics for our K-1 classrooms. And myself and another reading specialist were supporting that work in their classrooms for tier one. And we realized within the first half of the school year that we had a third of the first graders falling far below benchmark using that program. So the other reading specialist and I were pulling all of those students. We had almost 30 in our reading room and we were giving them a different tier one phonics program. And that's when we started to see um, growth. So units of study phonics does have some bells and whistles and it has some appeal to it. However, it's not systematic and it's not structured enough for all students. And we know that what we've chosen is what's best for all students, not what's best for 50% of students. And the, uh, I, I had one or two others. Um, one related to what Ms. Park was asking about the um, resources and mine was a little different in that I want to understand, so the, the, the four volumes for students, those are essentially four consecutive volumes that they'll be using. And there's, there's with what we'd be ordering, there'd be adequate resources to send them home, home if need be. So all right, that's, as far as with Mr. Lackner's question, the, the thing that came up, or questions, I guess, the thing that came up is, those things that you said were kind of lacking in the other programs that seem to be part of the 95, would, the, would those be things that, we would incur expenses in order to to fill in if we used one of those other programs would that would that in in other words I'm, i guess i'm looking at more of a marginal cost then if and we still don't even know what the difference is yet but i hope that question made sense uh a little bit <laughs> can you restate that one more time please? so i guess what I, I was asking is if we chose one of those other programs uh, it, it looked like each one of those programs of the others that were mentioned seemed to be lacking in one or two areas that the 95 program does have. Are those things that we would be incurring expenses to, to fill in, like, for example, the associated reading or the writing? So you're asking other supplemental needs to... Um, this program is that to what the I other programs. In other words, I guess to offset the the diff whatever difference there might be in cost. So let's say this program on the makeup numbers. This program is three hundred thousand, and another program is two hundred fifty thousand. Would there be fifty thousand dollars worth of other things we'd have to do to make up the difference between program two and this one? Yeah. Yeah. So I do um, with the other two. One with require us to purchase decodable text separate from that resource. The other one I would say probably the biggest challenge was providing the professional development. Um, the number of trainers that they have are limited and the type of training that they provide though very intense um, is very prescribed and it's difficult to schedule and arrange. Difficult. So those were the two, you know, taking like going through our rubric and looking at all of those different criteria, that is what put the 95% group uh, to the top of our list. So we get the, the, the quotable books, the professional development is more um, you know, on demand for us and what our needs are, and just more responsive to what we would require. Does that trigger any other? Okay. I can jump in about Please. Wilson's. I mean, I, from what I recall, it was four full days of training and I was actually uh, pleased that that was not selected, not because it isn't a fantastic and intense um, methodology, but I, my concern was is that the further you got away from the original training, the less people that would be trained and it would begin to fizzle out. Um, it, is, it's, it is a fantastic um, method to use, but I would say that it's, it's hard to use as a, as a core. I think as an intervention, when you have reading specialists who are Wilson's trained, that's different. Um, it's much smaller, have the ability to leave a building for several days and are, you know, throughout the course of a small amount of time. Um, and I know the training is also very expensive. So I'm guessing the cost when, when you go ahead and look um, will, be, will exceed 
um, the training for this. So I was actually pleased uh, to see that this was the selection. I'm, I'm just happy to see that we're, we're stressing phonics again. So um, as far as, um, I, well, I, I think that the only other question I had was regarding masks, but I guess that's more of a procedural question that um, I just, I happen to know a kindergarten teacher or two and uh, I know that, that that's been an issue that I asked for asked about last year is is how we're going to teach this when you know you can't see somebody making sound with their mouth. So um, any other? Yes. Um, you talked about the implementation program, and I appreciate that. You also talked about a 12-week uh, pilot program that you've run this year. Uh, talked about one school in Pennsylvania that's had positive success, and the fact that the newness of the program uh, leaves some of the data yet to be gathered. Given that, do we have an opportunity to license the material for a single building and to run a test for a school year or for some other period of time that gives us greater comfort um, versus deploying completely today? For example, picking a, a school that has perhaps the highest need for intervention or for this program and running the program there first to test what our results would be and then rolling it out more broadly. If, if, is the answer, could we do that? I suppose that would be up to you. Would that be the recommendation of the CDT? Absolutely not. Um, we uh, identified a resource that is aligned with the science of reading and all of the evidence that we have on what a systematic phonics control program looks like. So we're very committed to moving this forward and supporting teachers and implementing with the expectations that this will have a very positive impact on our students' overall literacy skills. Um, not only that you've used it this school year, Kim has used it some this school year. We have, we have that information, but we also have the science behind us that we've selected a resource that, that hits every single one of those, um, those areas. So we're committed to as a group. Um, that's what we're so excited to be here for today is to share this with you so that we can have it in front of all of our kids next school year. Sounded like Mrs. McCabe had a comment there. Um, is this within our budget? All right. Um, does anybody else have any additional questions, concerns? The one thing I would ask, uh, in addition to what Mr. Mr. Lackner is asking regarding, just what, if you shared those emails, what the training would cost, just so I have a better idea of it. More, more for my own edification than anything else but to know what you know so i can kind of compare and learn a little bit more about that okay Thank I, you. i'm sorry could oh, i make I'm a suggestion i i don't know if this is appropriate time maybe the board would um, appreciate getting that information along the packet the um for other resources when they come you know the pros and cons and maybe we get it, and I haven't read it closely, um, just so that we will, when we come to the table, we're prepared to see where we have that information ahead of time. So um, I think Mr. Lackner's questions are appropriate, and that would help us to have a discussion instead of coming and determining whether this goes on consent or we pull it off but maybe we need a little more in the packet when it comes to looking at resources and costs, maybe particularly when that resource is more new and has less data to support it. I don't know if other board members feel that way, but that may have answered some questions think, that we didn't have to wait for. I think that's a good suggestion. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would concur with that. Um, I think it's probably, again, as you say, especially since this is a new resource, a relatively new, um, it's probably a good idea. 
Um, well, with that being said, um, let's start with Ms. Barker. Do you feel comfortable putting this on consent or would you prefer? I do feel comfortable putting it on consent, but, I, but I'm also familiar with the intervention. So, um, and so I, I would feel comfortable uh, with that. I, for my part, I think it might be better to, to put it for action simply because there are some questions still out there. And I don't like to, uh, I, I, I don't know that I would, I would necessarily, I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but I think that, it, that since there are questions still out there, I think that they should probably be answered to make other board members feel more comfortable about, about their vote on the, on the program. We also don't, um, we don't have, one of, one of our board members is not here. Um, and then uh, we have an additional board member that will be joining us too. That's so that's true. a good point. That's a very good point. Thank you. So I think uh, probably would be best to put this one on for action. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I think we'll move on to our next our next topic, which is high school art resources. You've got me for the first trifecta here for the first three presentations. Um, but I am very lucky to be surrounded um, by some incredibly talented um, educators behind me. So if you don't mind, I just want to pass the mic and just acknowledge who's here this evening. I'm Gil Wilkich. I'm the fine arts lead teacher from St. Charles East High School. And I'm Sally Vincent. I'm the fine arts lead teacher for, um, no, pardon me, I'm art lead teacher for St. Charles North High School. I'm Nathan Shackelford. I'm a visual arts teacher at St. Charles East. Great, thank you. Um, so we're here tonight to present um, art resources for the high schools. Um, the recommendations and information shared within this presentation are aligned to policy um, 6, colon 210. In addition, this presentation is aligned to strategic commitment one and the school board commitment where both highlight the importance of providing learning opportunities that are responsive to our students for success within District 303 and beyond. We've already had some of our members introduce um, themselves behind me, but I'd also like to take the time to acknowledge those that are not here this evening. Without them, this work would not be possible. Please make note of the names in red, both of which are here this evening. Sally and Gil have been the driving force in this work. I'm grateful for their leadership and dedication to our teachers and students. At the start of the CDT work, the team worked together to develop a conceptual framework for art across our district. It reads, as part of a complete education, students in District 303 develop a lifelong relationship to visual and performing arts through creating performing, responding, and connecting. The National Core Art Standards is an art artistic process that guides educators in providing a unified quality arts education for students in pre-K through high school. The artistic processes are outlined on your screen are the cognitive and physical actions where learning and making are realized in all areas within fine arts. These processes were the driving force behind our work and informed the redesign of our curriculum. The table displayed in front of you shows the CDT timeline for our high school art courses. As you can see, this work began in 2018 with photo and has since covered film, animation, and new media, digital art design and illustration, and 2D and 3D media. Before moving to the cost for this year's resources, I'd like to turn it over to Sally Vincent, our St. Charles North lead teacher for art. something written down here so I might need to use my glasses and I do want to say that um, as the CDT has gone along um, every year we come and every year we are so appreciative of what has happened to the development of this program we waited a long time to get the visual arts um, program up and running into a good situation and we are loving it right now um, you could see from our friend Natalie um, the way things have worked and the programs that we have, how well they um, equated to 
remote learning and all the things that we can give to them outside of that, our brand new photography labs with the computers and the programs that we have, the cameras that we have, um, the things that we are doing with students in terms of getting their art, not just in this community, but outside in the state and in the nation. And that is what it's all about. So I have a little thing here I'm just going to say. On behalf of the art departments at St. Charles North and St. Charles East High School, I would like to extend our sincere appreciation and support of the Board of Education in our journey to rewriting the high school art curriculum. It has been four long and adventurous years since we started this journey. We have learned so much and have successfully developed strong skills and a creativity-based, vertically articulated curriculum in the visual art content areas. Through the support of this board, our administration, the learning and teaching department, and my colleagues at both high schools, we have created a curriculum that offers our high school students a progressive and challenging program that enables students to be competitive in state and national art shows, college scholarship opportunities, and college admission portfolios. Graduating senior art students this year have been offered collectively $659,000 in college scholarships over the next four years. Our new curriculum, which <clears throat> Dr. Warren stated, includes our five content areas of drawing and painting, digital illustration, sculpture and ceramics, photography, and film and animation. We are currently using state-of-the-art technology, equipment, supplies, and facilitators to develop the skills and creativity of the young artists in our programs. I would like to extend my thanks to my colleagues who have worked in teams after school, during SIP days, and over the summer months for the past four years to create this curricul curriculum that both challenges our students and engages them to achieve excellence. A special thank you to Dr. Christine Warren and the Learning and Teaching Department for ordering and documenting the necessary resources to support our new course offerings. <clears throat> to the board, the administration, the Learning and Teaching Department, and all of my colleagues, thank you most sincerely for your continued support in the development process of our high school visual art curriculum. So art is a little bit more challenging in terms of identifying um, resources because it uh, ranges from everything from consumables to durable. So you do have the spreadsheet in front of you and I have my wonderful colleagues behind me to answer specific questions. Um, but we thought it was important to highlight um, some of the resources that are already in place and what that has meant to our art departments at the high schools. So for this year, um, you do have a detailed um, list um, provided to you. We are looking for resources um, to support levels three in advanced for 3D media sculpture and ceramics, film and animation, and digital art and illustration. Although curriculum is never final, these are the last courses, as um, Sally discussed, to complete this process that began four years ago. We're truly appreciative of CD CDT's time and commitment in seeing this process through from the start. The totals you see in front of you include durables and consumables for the final six courses. We are asking that the high school art resources presented this evening be included for consent at the next regular school board meeting. Again, thank you for your time and ongoing support. And if there are any questions. Okay, this time we'll start over here. Um, first, uh, easy. how do we identify what's consumable versus durable on the spreadsheet? Okay, you seen that? That's a really great question, Ms. Fairgrave. Um, it is not designated as consumable and durable on there, but we'd be happy to go in and add that to the spreadsheet. Okay, that would be great. Sure. Uh, and then my next question is, so, um, I mean, it's clear a lot of effort has been put into this. So when will the next revisit come up? When will this come up again, that you'll take a look at this curriculum, the tools and how it's done, and then you'll work to, to look for opportunities for improvement? 
So the, um, this is kind of wrapping up the last of the CDTs mm -hmm. as we presented that CAI process will um, go into place. So we're looking at that from pre-K to 12 plus. Um, but I think it's important to note that, you know, we don't wait for that cycle to come up. Should there be um, Illinois adopt new standards or should there be changes that curriculum is living and breathing? And so we're always monitoring and, and um, the implementation and, and the courses. So um, I don't have the, the CA document in front of me right now, but I can get you that year as well of when the K pre-K 12 plus um, art will go through again. Okay, that would be great. And then to, to your comments, so what is the process? Do you get feedback from the teachers on when an area needs to be looked at for improvement or what is the process? How do you get that feedback? <laughs> So it's, it's great that you asked this question. Um, we just had a time together, the both East and North High School had some time together at our school improvement day. And we are already looking at our photo one and photo two curriculum that we developed in 2018 to see what are those things that are really knocking the socks off things and what are those things that maybe we're gonna reevaluate or revisit. So I think for curriculum in terms of art, the change of equipment and technology is, it happens overnight. I mean, you go into Adobe Photoshop one day and the next day there's five new tools and you're like, whoa, where, how, what do I do next? So we are constantly looking at what we are trying to do and reevaluating and revisiting what's going to be the best for the students and what's going to be the best for the students to manage based on scaffolding their learning from what they already know from their background knowledge. We have looked at um, part of the photo one and photo two curriculum and have um, made some adjustment, adjustments in terms of not anything major, but maybe some small things that we thought might be able to generate that curriculum a little bit differently, especially under the remote learning situation. Um, I think photo was one of our biggest changes that we had in 2018. We completely revamped the program we added digital photography, which brought us the fabulous um, labs for editing and um, making all the good things that we do. It's just incredible to walk into those rooms and watch what the students are doing. I'm like floored every day. So we are, we are never sitting on our hands, I guess. We are constantly looking, revising, reflecting, and you know, already starting to generate some ideas of those first programs that started. Four years seems like a long time and you kind of like to hang your hat on the hook and say, woohoo, it's done. But that's not how it works. And we're fully aware of that, especially in the content areas that we're in. Anyone else? <laughs> All right, thank you. Mr. Lackner, any questions, concerns? How much have we spent on the program as a whole through that four-year process and what percentage of that spend is represented here in this 45,000? I'd have to get you those numbers, but I'm happy to do that. Just order a magnitude. Is, it, is, is this a small portion or a big portion? Uh, this actually is lower than what, in my three years that I've been here, this is the lowest amount that it has been. It is typically in the last two years, I wanna just ballpark between yep. 95 and 100,000. Okay, um, thank you. I, I just, uh, for my part, I recall those numbers kind of coming up. Was, I was actually surprised when the number popped up that it was a little lower than I expected to see. So, and some of that is going to be dictated too, isn't it, by by the interest in the in the various courses. So you're, I don't think that that's a number that can ever, you can't really, you know, put a dart in that number because it's kind of moving all the time, isn't it? So, um, but okay. Um, well, any. Over here. Um, Six hundred and fifty thousand dollars in scholarships. Is that what? Um, association exhibit, and they do a digital portfolio where they upload their work, and over two hundred colleges have access to looking at their work, and the students are literally sent letters and emails that said congratulations we are giving you eighteen thousand dollars a year for four years and some students had offers of you know up to fifty thousand from various schools it's amazing to see 
And I think also a good thing for parents to um, see and understand that there are so many careers in the art world now based on the digital and technological things that are happening. And art schools are not, they're expensive. And to have a little, we also had juniors and sophomores um, put work in on what they call the early college program. And we had um, a, a couple students, three students from North were um, given uh, scholarships for the early college program at the University of Illinois, um, the Cleveland Institute of Art. I can always remember that because it's CIA. Mm -hmm. And then um, another Cleveland school, I, I apologize, I can't remember that name. But they were given scholarships as juniors and sophomores to attend the art program during the summer. And so they get kind of their foot in the door. They get to see how to make a nice portfolio if, if they want to go forward with art as a career. And it really offers the students a lot of opportunity. Um, I think that one of the things we're striving for is to not just have art here and enjoy it here in our community, but to get those students out and let them see what's going on and put them in the competitive ring that everyone else is in. So there were about 200 high schools, I believe, that participated in the Illinois High School Art Exhibit um, this year. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's less, but it is a great opportunity for students to get some no notoriety. I mean, even as juniors and as sophomores, and then to get some scholarship offers as seniors. Thank you. Mrs. Parker. Okay. Um, I am comfortable with putting this on the consent agenda given the, the, the numbers. And so I think um, like we can put this on consent um, unless we have any objections. I have no objections. Okay. And I will get that spreadsheet updated with durables and consumables as well as past costs over the four years. Thank you. Okay, and next up would be high school math resources. as I said, I'm the trifecta tonight. So this is the, the third presentation. Um, unfortunately, due to medical reasons, um, ADA and conflicts, our CDT members could not attend this evening. So the presentation is recorded. My name is Christine Warren and I am the Director of Curriculum here to begin the High School Math Resource presentation. Also presenting this evening is our High School Math TOSA Justin Brennan and two of our CDT members Doug McCullough and Sarah Fox. The recommendations and information shared within this presentation are aligned to policy 6 colon 210 and 6 colon 220. In addition, this presentation is aligned to Strategic Commitment 1 and the School Board Commitment, where both highlight the importance of providing learning opportunities that are responsive to our students for success within District 303 and beyond. Before we move forward with our recommendation, it is important to acknowledge our secondary math curriculum development team. Without them, this work wouldn't be possible. We appreciate their time, commitment, and flexibility throughout the process to identify a resource that best supports our students and teachers. During this presentation, we will cover the District 303 Math Pathways, the Standard and Honors Level Mathematics Resources, and Next Steps. The District 303 Mathematics Pathways Diagram shows three pathways for students in District 303. However, please note that there are multiple opportunities for students to move among the pathways. But the red and gray dotted line arrows show students' ability to move within the pathways. There are a variety of reasons why students would choose to move diagonally in either direction. Next, we'll be presenting the standard level mathematics resource. The math CDT process began in January 2020. In April of 2020, the math CDT recommended illustrative mathematics for Algebra 1, along with a continuation of Geometry and Algebra 2 for the 21-22 school year. 
By doing so, it would provide a more coherent mathematical experience for our students. In addition, in May, the board approved both Illustrative Mathematics for Algebra and Alex, its digital companion for standard and honors levels courses through Algebra II. The next steps in the process were to identify needs and resources to support our honors level courses. Over the summer, synchronous professional learning was made available to all algebra teachers for illustrative mathematics and to all teachers that would have access to Alex. As presented last year, we would like to continue our adoption of illustrative mathematics, also called IM, as the core resource for our algebra, geometry, and algebra two courses. Illustrative mathematics is a problem-based core curriculum designed to address content and practice standards to foster learning for all, prepare students to solve problems, reason, communicate, and think critically in the classroom and beyond. Students learn by doing math, solving problems in mathematical and real world contexts, and constructing arguments using precise language. Continuing with this adoption from middle school and Algebra 1 into Geometry and Algebra 2 allows for a more coherent transition for our students as well as provide common mathematical language and routines. Illustrative Mathematics offers rich, engaging content that is focused, coherent, and rigorous. As each unit progresses, students are systematically introduced to representations, context, concepts, language, and notation. As their learning progresses, they make connections between different representations and strategies to consolidate their conceptual understanding. Students see and understand more efficient methods of solving problems to support the shift toward procedural fluency. In addition, students have opportunities to make connections to real-world context throughout the material. Illustrative Mathematics was first made available for adoption for this current school year. Unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, there was an impact on mathematics resource adoptions across the country. We'll have a more up-to-date list provided by each publisher within Illinois once district resources are board approved. Nationally, there are several hundred schools, including Jefferson County School District in Kentucky and Newport Mesa School District in Orange County. In addition, you'll see a map Michigan has produced highlighting where IM is being used. Ed Reports is an independent nonprofit that delivers reviews of instructional materials. Illustrative Mathematics content meets expectations in all Ed Reports, gateways, and earn perfect scores for focus and coherence, rigor, and math practices and usability. Illustrative Mathematics scored an 18 out of 18 for focus and coherence, 16 out of 16 for rigor and math practices, and 36 out of 36 for usability. I'm now going to turn it over to Justin Brennan to walk through some sample problems from IM. To highlight how I am ready students for the SAT, we can specifically look in depth at the three primary domains, part of algebra, problem solving and data analysis, and passport to advanced math. This hard algebra problem from the fall 2020 grade 11 PSAT asks students to consider an open parameter so that a linear system has a special solution. In a traditional textbook, students are only asked to graph a specific concrete example of a linear system. However, in IM, students go beyond just graphing. Students in this activity are asked to create a second equation, providing an experience more open-ended than in a traditional textbook. This added rigor is more aligned to the PSAT's required goal for this problem. This Passport to Advanced Math problem for the Fall 2020 Grade 11 PSAT asks students to vary a rectangular configuration to maximize the area. This is at the core a contextual quadratic representation. In a traditional textbook, students are often exposed to quadratic relationships only by representations, not in any particular context. However, in IM, students are exposed to the context in the quadratic, of the quadratic from the start. Students in this activity are asked to create and explore different configurations and then create a representation. The foundation of context helps students to make better connections to the mathematical relationships and more closely mirrors the PSAT question. This problem solving and data analysis problem from the fall 2020 grade nine PSAT asks students to make statistical inferences based on a diagram. In a traditional textbook, this is presented without context and from a more procedural lens. However, in the IM unit assessment question, students must interpret the data within context and validate statements based off of deeper levels of statistical knowledge. Now I'm going to turn it back to Christine. 
Alex is McGraw-Hill's digital tool to support fluency. We would like to continue our use of Alex in Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Alex is aligned and fully integrated with Illustrative Mathematics to provide additional support with fluency and skills practice. Alex can also be used as an adaptive online math program that uses artificial intelligence and open response questioning to identify precisely what each student knows and doesn't know. Through truly individualized learning and assessment, Alex delivers a personalized learning path on the exact topics each student is most ready to learn. The Alex software has provided detailed student learning progress information unique to all users of the program. This data provides teachers with a level of feedback that we have not had access to before Alex. Teachers can look in depth at individual student learner profiles and provide whatever necessary interventions they deem most appropriate. Teachers can also see what students are ready to learn based on actual demonstration of knowledge. The total cost for illustrative mathematics for Algebra, Geometry, and Algebra 2 is $242,841.96 for three years. I'm now going to turn it over to Doug McCullough to begin sharing the Honors Level Mathematics Resource Recommendation. The Honors Level Math CDT started meeting in January. Initial meetings focused more on defining honors courses in mathematics, developing our team's belief about the student mathematics experience in the district, and analyzing data to aid decision making. Then meetings transitioned to more specifically around data specific to the honors pathway and reviewing and evaluating available resources. Ed Reports was used to guide the team to the best available primary resources for honors level mathematics that are currently still being published. Many of these resources were similarly vetted during the prior year's CDT process. These provided a starting point for the team's resource evaluation process. And I'm now going to turn it over to Sarah Fox to talk about the evaluation tool and resource recommendation. We utilized the instructional materials evaluation tool rubric as a foundation for our rubric. From there, the CDT provided feedback and made revisions to reflect the needs of our community. The team evaluated each program's alignment and coherence, rigor and balance, instructional supports, assessment, technology integration, professional learning, and equity and access. The CDT unanimously supported recommending Envision AGA by Savas as the primary resource for Honors Geometry and Honors Algebra 2, while other supplemental resources will be considered to support in deepen learning in our Honors courses and Vision will provide a coherent and comprehensive resource that will best meet the needs of the Honors Mathematics Program for D303. I'm now going to turn it over to Justin Brennan to share more information about the Envision resource. Similar to illustrative mathematics, Envision meets the expectations in all Ed Reports gateways. Envision scored a 14 out of 18 for focus and coherence, 15 out of 16 for rigor and math practices, and 30 out of 36 for usability. Personalization is integrated into the Envision program, particularly the adaptive practice. In addition, there are several ways students can interact with the learning, including interactive prompts from Desmos. Each unit or topic in Envision is connected to a central open-ended task. In Act 1 of the task, students are engaged through a video that highlights a problem that is central to the goals of the topic. Students develop questions that are necessary to create the appropriate model. In Act 2, Envision information is slowly revealed and students connect their understanding to solve the problem. In Act 3, the solution is revealed and students check their results. Often in Act 3, the application can be extended to encourage additional thinking. Having a centralized contextual problem helps students to make connections. Listed on the screen in front of you is a list of current users of Envision provided by the publisher along with their corresponding courses. There are several aspects of Envision that the CDT found to strongly support our honors math programs. One strength was the broad scope of topics, including plus standards and topics beyond the core standards. 
Another strength of Envision is in regards to supporting D303 Honors math courses is that it has built-in opportunities for enrichment in every lesson, which can be accessed both digitally and on paper. Math Excel is Savas' digital companion tool to support fluency. The Envision program has integrated Math Excel components for student practice and differentiation in every lesson. Students can receive supports on demand and immediate feedback. Teachers receive information on where students are needing the most support so they can tailor any necessary intervention and extension opportunities to maximize opportunities for student growth. The total cost for Envision AGA is $81,483.31. This includes all teacher resources, student textbooks, online portal access for both teachers and students, and consumable workbooks. I'll turn it back over to Christine. Again, thank you, Doug, Sarah, and Justin for your contributions. I'm now going to talk about next steps in professional learning. The next steps for a CDT is to align the scope and sequence between standard and honors. By doing so, our students are able to move diagonally in their pathways without missing or repeating content. Assessment maps will be created for all standard and honors level courses within Algebra, Geometry, and Algebra 2. Next, we'll find, continue to finalize our plans for professional learning that will take place this summer. And lastly, we feel it is important that we share this information with key stakeholders within, within the community. We'll work collaboratively with the Director of Staff, Family, and Student Services to coordinate um, parent university opportunities for our families to learn more about the mathematics and our resources our students will be engaged in. Professional learning is critically important to the success of any curriculum and or resource implementation. Professional learning will begin in early summer for both standard and honors levels. In addition to specific training on the resources, logistics, and philosophies, we'll also be supporting all teachers with P Peter Lillydahl's Thinking Classroom Workshop which focuses on effective practices and mathematics instruction to better engage students. In addition, it is important to allow teachers time to put their learning into practice, so we will embed PLC flex time to foster collaboration and extend their learning. Teachers will also be provided ongoing support during the school year once they become immersed into the curriculum. Ongoing professional learning will be provided to help new and existing teachers. We are also shifting the teacher on special assignment position from curriculum development to an implements, implementation specialist to support our new curriculum and resources. For both honors and standard, we will measure the success of the implementation across three metrics, including student achievement data, implementation data, and collective capacity data. We are asking that all of the items presented this evening be included for consent at the next regular school board meeting. Thank you for your time and ongoing support. All right, well, I think we can, I think we started here last time. We'll start over here this time. I'm not as well versed in high school mathematics as I am in phonics. So my questions are a little broader. Um, could you, and, and I apologize if you've already done this, could you talk about ed reports? I see that one of our resources is highly, highly rated and the other one is not as high. So could you talk to us about how that is seen and um, just kind of the background of it? It's, it's, is it a fairly new resource to districts in terms of curriculum ed reports or the ed, re the ed reports. I'm not sure how long ed reports has been around. I don't have the um, starting of that, but it's a non-for-profit organization that um, um, has people that um, review for content for the different gateways that um, were listed in the presentation. So that has typically been our starting point um, for things that are rated, we call it green, because there's green, yellow, and red. Um, for those that have been vetted and approved by reviewers um, for us to consider before moving forward. So that's just been one of our barometers in terms of which resources we want to bring forward for review. So, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I try not to jump in, but before you go to the next one, I, I had really a similar question. Do we know what the Ed Reports process is or, or who the people are who are vetting via Ed Reports? Sure, I don't, I don't have that information with me, but I'm happy to provide that. Um, they, they provide pretty lengthy um, reports. I don't know if you've ever been on there. 
it'll go in detail of everything that they found within the resources and the, the strength and the opportunities for growth within. But I'm happy. I've seen them for other others, but I've frankly, I even for resources I've looked at in the past for science, I, I've not. Uh, and I'm not even sure if it's the same organization, but they, I, you know, I'm not sure what their process is. And so I, I kind of like to know for my own edification as well. And, and maybe that, uh, again, maybe that's a, a something we should have public. We've been getting inundated about the resources, and I, I think other board members will speak to that more eloquently than I will. But knowing what your background research is and where you're getting it would give more confidence to the resource when it comes forth, maybe. So that I, having maybe having an item on L and T sometime about you know how they do their process. Can you talk about why one resource we're get why the envisions is not as high as illustrative math and um, how you how you as a CDT took that into account? We did take did take that into account in, in looking at the resources. Um, the CDTs, the, the original CDT that met last year was looking at it through the lens of standard level. And the CDT that started meeting this year was really looking at it through the lens of honors. And so when the team evaluated those resources, utilizing the same rubric, they were looking at it through two different lenses. Um, and so the honors CDT felt that the Envision met more of the needs for our honors students. Um, unfortunately, they're not here to, to right. share um, more details about that. Um, but I think their lens and looking through and evaluating those resources were very different. One of the concerns that I, I hear about quite a bit is the math scores have been dropping. Um, and the concern about SAT scores, um, AP scores, things like, you know, those, that data. Uh, um, I'm, I come from the thinking that the curriculum is one piece, the resource is another piece, and instruction is the most important piece. So getting a new resource, um, how are, I, I know we're doing professional learning, but is instruction changing? Is instruction, is, it, are we seeing, I, I guess the real basic question is, if our math scores are going down, how can one resource absolutely take care of that? Is there, have you, I'm sure you've been, everybody's been talking about it. It's, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why our math scores are going down. Where did, where is the root cause? How do we make, how do we make that dramatic change so that our scores go up? And I'm not articulating it very well, but I'm wondering how this resource will help increase instruction, improve instruction so student achievement will increase. Uh, that's a really great question. Um, the IM is a problem-based curriculum, and um, we, I, I don't know if you want it for standard or honors, Ms. McCabe, does it, or both, <laughs> probably both. Give, give me it all. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the Common Core State Standards were implemented in the year 11-12, um, and at that time, many publishers were putting out text and stamping Common Core on it without really fully understanding what Common Core was. And so we are using um, our court, current report of proof resources, CPM. Um, that resource has a copyright, I believe, of 2012, which is right when um, Common Core State Standards, just like phonics, we've learned a lot more about how students learn math and how that's shifted. Um, I taught high school math, and when I was in that, everything was EPAS. It was the Explore Plan ACT, <laughs> and, and that's what we, um, the SAT and the ACT are very different. The SAT approaches mathematics in a very different way. And if you saw the samples on there, you'll see that it's um, more open-ended and not that procedural skills and um, that we're seeing in more of the traditional textbooks. Um, there isn't a resource that's gonna just come in and wave its magic wand and going to resolve everything. We have to respond to the learners in front of us. That's why we felt it was really important to bring in um, Peter Lillydahl in that thinking classroom to really look at our instructional practices and how we're delivering mathematics to our students 
Um, and so we're really excited about that. So that, that time with him, along with the um, professional learning and training for the resource itself, it's really bringing those two worlds together. And how do we shift our instruction based on um, best practices? So I think it's a, there's not one resource that you're gonna implement and it, it, you know, wave a magic wand and it's magically going to get better. But I do think that currently it's just an alignment issue right now um, with the resource that we currently have. And, and we've strayed from it at times, trying to respond to the learners in front of us, um, both in vision and illustrative mathematics are aligned to Common Core State Standards. So that alignment alone um, should really help us um, in terms of our performance, our student performance on the SAT. I did like the example of, here's what a traditional textbook does, here's what the IM does to the, with the SAT. Um, I'm curious um, about Alex and how was it used this year? Did teachers use it? Did, what feedback did you get in terms of how it, you know, how, how it helps strengthen support for kids? Sure, we're using um, Alex more to support that fluency. Um, we have um, what's called a knowledge check, and so students took that um, assessment in the fall, and that, similar to iReady, um, where it created a personalized pathway for students to work um, independently. So they took the knowledge check based on the course that they were enrolled in. So if I was an algebra student, I took um, the knowledge check on algebra to assess my readiness for, um, for algebra. They also took a winter assessment, um, at that same knowledge check, again, to assess where they're at and to revise that um, personalized pathway if needed. Um, the hard part about Alex is it's not, it's not normed to anything. There's no benchmarks. And so really it's meant to be a tool that's closer to the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so we've seen teachers who are using it for um, additional practice for more of that procedural skills. We have also used it as part of our um, assessment. So we've utilized the IM assessments, but we took the DO1, DOK one and twos and replicated those in Alex so that students would take half of a written and half of an assessment. So it's been used in a variety of ways. Um, and that's currently being used all the way through our Algebra 2 honors. So our Algebra, both levels of geometry and both levels of Algebra 2, um, all have access to Alex and are utilizing it in a variety of ways. Um, we've had some conversations about what Alex looks like because we also have Math Excel, um, which is Savas. Pearson is much easier to say, so if I interchange those two, I apologize. Um, but really looking at having both of those tools next year for us, um, that's a lot for a teacher or potentially a student to shift systems. Um, so we're really looking closely at those digital tools and what best aligns and meets the needs of our students. Thank you. Um, it has, in, in my work, a lot, it's about school improvement work. And one of the questions that we are really um, coaching people to think about is how did my instruction influence the student learning problem? We tend to think about the outcomes of students rather than what the instruction did to influence, contribute, make it more successful to figure out what is the root cause. Um, it's a different way of looking at things, um, and I would I I have I don't have any influence on that here in this district, but I would encourage people to continually go back to the instructional practice, knowing that the resource is there as a support, but it's really how kids um, get that information and the strategies and practices that teachers use. At least that's the way I, I read the research. So. so one of the things that we're really excited about is to, to shift the responsibilities of that, our current TOSA position from a curriculum development to an implementation specialist to support. Not only will they serve in that capacity, but they'll also have what we call a lab classroom in the district um, where we could have teachers go in and watch, where we could do recordings. But that, that um, TOSA position will really serve as a coach um, and as Dr. Palagi says, boots on the ground, it's the one, to, the, the TOSA is the one who's going to get into those classrooms and, and all serve as a really content area coach. Um, um, that we, our current coaches at the high school level are not math, so we're really excited about this position to target specifically mathematics instruction in the secondary level. Thank you for talking about that because I was interested in that as well. So thank you, Dr. Warren. Yeah.
move over here and it looks like there's Mrs. Fairgree is next. Thank you. Um, can we start just to circle back related to the ed report? So how long have you been using that and evaluating curriculum? I have been using it for the three years that I have been in this district. Okay. I can't say historically. I don't know if anybody else who's been in the district longer than that could speak to that, but I've used it on the three years that I've been here. Okay. I know it was used before I came here, but I can't tell you um, when that started to be used. Okay. And then when it's, uh, when they are evaluating the curriculum, I guess, let me ask it this way. Are they evaluating the curriculum with an honors lens? at any time so when they evaluated this particular resource and they gave that scoring did they look at it with an honors lens in mind or how do they not for not for ed reports no it doesn't um they're not looking at it through either lens of standard or honors they're just looking for that focus and coherence that usability they're just looking for those um, larger pieces through the lens of just mathematics in general so geometry would be looked at as geometry as a whole okay I think we have an answer to your first question. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. We've been oh. using Ed Reports since 2015. Okay. And that's how long Ed Reports has been around. Okay. Thank you. Are you familiar at all with, with their procedures? Or their... So Mrs. King is probably the best one to speak to, to that, okay. but it's a very intensive process. They have reviewers from all over the country that vet that, that different resources. There is a rubric that's used and it looks at alignment, it compares all sorts of different resources for math, science, ELA. So, um, Ed Reports, they um, actually uh, develop a rubric for each content area. They hire and train uh, teachers and university personnel from across the country, and they work through the rubric with the resources. Um, none of the reviewers are paid, as a volunteer position, and um, then they publish the reports. I, I got the chance to work extensively with the science program for Ed Reports, and one of the things they filled me in on is they rate the resources, but then it's the job of the community to look at the ratings and decide what fits the community best. They are just rating on those ratings. They're not saying, this is the best resource for you, they're saying this is the resource that's best based on our rubric. So that's something we need to consider when we look at every place. And the other thing is uh, to remember about IM, that resource is written by the author of the Common Core Standards. So you would expect that that resource would have the highest rating because the person that wrote the standards also wrote it. Um, thank you for that. Um, you. The next, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Mc, okay. Um, I didn't have a chance to really digest the slide in terms of the other districts that are using Envision. So are any of the uh, districts that we compare ourselves to, that course six or eight, are any of those using this resource? You're talking specifically about Envision? Yes. Um. Geneva is on there. They're using it for just um, standard level algebra one. Um, our benchmark districts, Geneva would be the only one that we use as a benchmark. Um, it's being used, if I could talk about all levels, because that's probably more pertinent to what we're talking about, because some of them use it for just standard level and some of them use it for just honors and some of them use it for both. So for honors, um, district 214, um, is using it for um, Algebra 2 honors. Coal City, um, I had a flat tire there once, um, but that's all levels that they um, use in Vision. Lockport Township um, uses it for all levels, and Elmwood Park High School also uses it for all levels. The other districts, um, Caneland, Highland Park, and Rock Island, and Sterling, um, Savas, also known as Pearson, um, did not provide what levels that is being um, used at. Okay. On, on that note, I actually, because we use Savas where I'm at, it, Pearson is easier to say. I'm, I've been used to saying Pearson for years. Um, they mentioned Glenview as well, I believe, who's using it for honors. But the, the I have kind of, a, and I'll, I'll let Mrs. Fergie finish, but I have some 
questions regarding the use of this for us. If I could address that really quick, Mr. McNally, um, some of the other users that they provided were actually previous copies. Um, we did not feel that that would be um, appropriate if they weren't using the resource in which we would be adopting. So those um, school districts that are using an earlier version of Envision, they're not included in this user list. Thank you, that, that, uh, that helps because I didn't get a complete answer from, from the uh, representative from Santa. So that's, that's helpful that I, I didn't realize when I was, and that was the only one that popped into my head that was not on the list, but of course that's not one of our normal comparisons. Yeah, I believe we removed, I wanna say three to five and I'd be happy to provide that. But again, it's just not this actual resource. So we did not feel yeah. that it- Well, then it's not apples to apples and I prefer not to be. So I'm, I'm glad you removed that distraction for me. Um, the next question that I had then, so um, do we have the data around, we'll use Geneva, for example, do we have data around uh, their student outcomes that they've seen specifically related to honors. Geneva's only using it in their standard level algebra. Oh, I'm sorry, you said that. Yeah, yeah. I, and I don't have the data from any of these districts um, to, to respond to that question for any of them. Okay. Um, I could certainly go on and work with Mr. Shazar to get that information from other districts. Um, I just don't have, the hard part is I don't know that they would be able to break it down by standard and honors. So that would be something we'd have to work with the district to see if we can get that information. Um, because then my follow up to that, it, even just looking at the quote that we were given for Envision, it specifically notates Common Core. So I'm just trying to confirm is Envision an honors resource or is this really addressing meeting Common Core standards only? Well, I think it's both. So remember that it's a, just a resource, right? And, and so our teachers are teaching the standards and they're utilizing the resource to help them. And whether that be for student practice, um, Envision does have three levels of assessments. It does have that differentiation um, ability to meet the needs of the students. Um, so the answer is it's, it's a resource and it's designed to meet the needs of all students. Um, there are enrichment opportunities in there, but there's also opportunities um, for um, additional practice. Um, so it, it kind of meets that spread, that gamut of the learners that would be in front. There isn't a, that I know of, there is not a book that is titled Geometry Honors or you know something that would designate honors or standard level. Um, the standards are the standards, whether they're in standard level or whether they're in honors level. The standards don't change between those. That's, that's, if I could interject, that's true, but based on even our course offerings that we publish, we specifically define honors as exceeding common course standards. So I'm trying to ascertain yeah. how we're going to do that. Yes, so there's what's called plus standards. Um, those are in addition to, um, they are not required, but um, Envision does add those plus standards into um, their curriculum. So that was something, into the resource, I'm sorry. That was something that was intriguing to the teachers because they felt that they covered, um, like law of sines and law of cosines, um, is not something that is traditionally taught, but it's a it's a plus standard that could be embedded in. So they liked having those additional topics that could be covered in honors. So that might be what what you're hearing is you know that that's that they extend or they exceed beyond that. There are additional Common Core standards um, that are covered in Envision. They're called the plus standards. And, and is that how we meet our definition for honors? No, by the using the plus standards. No, that's or? a really great question. The team really had a lot of conversation about um, what doesn't what does honors look like? How is that different? Um, it was very difficult because when you start talking about it and you remove the student characteristics and you really start talking about the mathematics um, for honors, it really is that um, deeper understanding. They go into more depth. Mm -hmm. um, and more challenging. Um, we did survey, well, the lead teachers at the high schools did send out a survey to local districts and ask, but how do you determine the difference between standard and honors? Um, had some very interesting responses to that. Um, but really it's just that most of them said it's just more challenging, it's a more rigorous experience. Um, and so they, they end up, they're able to cover, and I have to be careful how I say this, they're able to cover more, but not in a way of necessarily more content, but they're able to get through it quicker, which allows them the time and opportunity for those enrichment opportunities. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we say more, we have to be careful that it's not, we're not saying 
they're doing 20 additional topics that are not, it's that they're able to go through it a little bit quicker to allow for those more in-depth um, investigations in the honors level. Ms. Fugues, I'm, I'm just gonna jump in real quick. Yeah. Um, because I, I did inquire um, about this with Savas, um, about their recommendations. Um, and what I did get, uh, the information I did get, is that um, Envision is a standard resource. And if they were looking to, and, it, and that's what it says in the brochure, if you look, that's what it says, standard resource. They do have another resource. And in fact, you uh, had a picture of the uh, lady who uh, wrote the material um, on, pay, on slide 33. Um, and they do have another resource that they do term as honors and also could be used for standard. It is more rigorous. And so they, they feel that that meets, um, you know, the concept rigor that would need to be in an honors class. And it's just that same company. Um, and they do use her videos um, both in her program as well as um, in the Math Excel. Um, so I just, I inquired about that, which then I thought, well, does it really meet that additional depth of content that's in our, our um, course offering? Is it really the complexity, um, even when the company is saying this is really standard um, and they would, they would not term it in the brochure or in a conversation that I had um, inquiring about that. So I just wanted to jump in and no, I appreciate that. And let you know that I did get that information. I, I'm going to jump in as well because I think they were getting bothered by us then because I made the, <laughs> again made a phone call. Um, I got kind of the a, a bit of a an unclear answer, but one of the things they talked about, and this was a concern, this was a question I had right from the start, was the supplementation. Um, I know for my part over the years when I've had to supplement things and I didn't have the supplementation, you know, I fortunately have 30 years of files of my own that I can go to, but that doesn't mean, and I'll share those with other teachers, but that doesn't mean we're standardizing this as curriculum. And what I kind of like to see us do is standardize whatever we're doing so that every student is, every student in, in the standard level is getting that, that same experience and every student at the honors level is getting that same experience and not what one teacher happened to have in his file and maybe was able to share with others. Um, so I, they kind of said that they have some resources that could be used and she was going to send me some things. I, I haven't gotten it yet, but um, that's where my discomfort in using this as an honors uh, for as the envision for honors is because they've they've really essentially indicated that it is a standard level um, I won't say text because it's it's mostly online materials but um, and I, I'm just I'm I don't want teachers to have to constantly try to supplement on their own and, and because then we've got students getting vastly different experiences which may be okay but um, you know if, if somebody's got something standardized then then we all, we know what each student's getting and I think it makes it easier to identify where where gaps lie. I don't know if you if you want if you have or want a comment to that or um, I have a final question. Sure just in terms of what um, Sava says um, I did speak with um, our, our rep today um, the presentation that was provided um, to the CDT when we reviewed the resources that um, we showed on the screen, we asked them to present it through the lens of honors. So illustrative mathematics, we said to present it through the lens of honors. In vision, we asked to you know, present on, in, you know, with an honors focus. We'd be all of the publishers that we reached out to, um, they were asked to provide a presentation that was specific to how do we enrich um, and how do we provide for that level of rigor and challenge that our honors students need. Um, so the focus of those presentations and what they made available to teachers um, utilizing that rubric, that's what the teachers um, felt was the, the best fit resource for our honors program. So I guess my follow-up to that, how do we think about, how should we be thinking about the fact that Envision has it has an honors course or resource offering compared to what we're looking at here? 
so that's a really great question. When we reached out to Pearson, um, Ms. Barker, I would love to know what that program is because when we reached out to publishers, those were the resources that, um, and using um, ed reports um, for those resources that are evaluated. Uh, the program was written by Elaine Martin Gay, um, and she's uh, the lady featured in on slide 33. Um, it is her videos that will be in Math Excel. Um, so I would actually inquire about that because her, her she also has higher advanced and, and there's a flow through and that has been a concern. I know in the past that our honors courses are not necessarily getting to what students need. It may meet the standards, but it's not getting to what the students need in those advanced courses and they're really struggling when they hit, you know, they're starting to hit pre-calc. Pre and um, especially, you know, once you get to C, and then, and then calculus and beyond, they're really struggling. Um, our physics AP, which now we're talking really about math again, um, the numbers are declining because they're kind of struggling in those. Um, when you see our scores for AP, um, I'm wondering if we need to look at something that isn't just about hitting the, the standard. And I know you're, you're talking about, there's some additional pieces, right? in Envision that really gets to what they're going to need when they get into advanced math. Because our honors kids are more likely to be in advanced math um, later on. So I, I'm wondering if we need to maybe have a little more time with this. And I, I think some of those struggles that we're seeing in students in the higher level math classes, again, goes back to a previous comment when I was talking to Ms. McCabe about the alignment I um, mean, really making that shift and that move to Common Core, um, we just, we aren't fully there. Um, and so while the resource is not the curriculum, the resource will ensure that we are covering the standards and that there is alignment across the district in those courses. Um, so some of it is, an, is certainly an alignment issue um, that I believe um, will help address some of those needs of our students when they get to the higher level map where they really need that foundation of Algebra One. Um, that to me is kind of the gateway course for mathematics is really building that foundation for future success in, in subsequent math classes, but also science classes as well. Did you, that was Math Excel, is that the name of the? That's the personalized learning um, system that they want to add on. That's not actually. The, it's a, it's the an add on to it. It's like Envision. Alex. Okay. It's, it's similar to Alex. So there's two, two different things for Math Excel. Math Excel is as um, naturally integrated and embedded within Envision. Um, those are in the plastic backpacks that you have. Um, we are not using Math Excel as a. Um, there is a standalone Math Excel, um, but the that Math Excel that goes with Envision does have a lot of those tools, but it is aligned specifically to that resource. So it's not the full blown. Math Excel program. If that makes sense. And before we go any further, Mr. Lackner, I, I seem to have left you out of the conversation, and I didn't didn't well, mean I, to do I that. Have we two were two more questions. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I'm, you know, I think part of the board's responsibility is student outcomes. So I'm very interested. And would like to see what you and the team are projecting. Um, we should see an improvement specifically on that measure that you had in the presentation around the SAT suite of assessments. And I'm, I'm assuming that's PSAT and SAT Correct. math results. So I, I don't know what that really means. I'd, I'd like to know how much improvement you think that these resources as part of additional strategy are going to improve those scores. So that I don't know if that's a takeaway for the committee, but I think um, it, it's difficult for me to give a full assessment on the recommendation without understanding what the student improvement will be. Um, because to the earlier point made, the, the, our performance on the SAT math is definitely consistently on a decline and the AP uh, math scores are also on a decline. Um, and you know, everything's building blocks. So. Um, that's and then the only other question I had or comment, I'm I'm interested in what our thought process is around why we don't have honors algebra um, that we offer um, even to freshmen. So that's another takeaway. Thank you. 
So I'll just toss on to add on to that just and then Mr. Lack, I'm sorry, just to add on to that because uh, Mrs. Barker made a comment about, you know, the, the courses that students are, are not performing as well. And, and there is a domino effect in math. It's, it, and it, it starts really, as you said, with algebra. And there's a domino effect that, that if you don't have that basis as we progress, and then it moves its way into chemistry and physics that are, you know, that are both math-based sciences, um, and particularly as you get to the higher level ones. So I have a concern. I want to make sure that that we do our due diligence to get this completely right because we've we've been through. I don't know in the time that I've been on the board, we've been through a couple of different discussions about math curriculum. I want to make sure we get it right because the scores we have to we have to do a U-turn on the scores. And I'm happy to work with um, Mr. Shazar and, and present some um, expected outcomes or expected growth, but I, a resource isn't going to resolve all of our issues. And I, I just want to make sure that, you know, this is a shift not only in utilizing the resource, but really looking at our instructional practices, um, which David talked about. Um, just an understanding, you know, how students learn mathematics. And I learned a lot about phonics. I'm going through the phonics program um and so you know we want to make sure that we're addressing um and that was similar to when um the district moved to the workshop model and, and started utilizing units of study it's really that instructional shift more so than it is the resource um we don't have a lot of data from this year in terms of cause and effect but if i could provide one example we did see um for our freshmen, we did see a full point growth in data um, problem solving and data analysis, which we've never had that growth before this fall. Um, that was our first unit that we utilized IM. Did that cause it? We don't know, but that was pretty exciting to see that their performance after that unit of instruction resulted in a one point in terms of you know how many questions are in that category. So again, did the resource cause that? Did the instruction cause that? We don't know, but it was pretty exciting um, positive correlation that we saw as a result of just that one unit implemented in the fall. Yeah, I, I just a quick comment. I agree with you that the resources is only one component. And that's probably why I think a bigger question that we should be asking is what is the high school math strategy? Um, and how are we going to tackle the results? Because we at the table have been talking about high school math uh, for the last couple of years. And so I, I'm, that's, I guess what I'm I'm thinking to move to the next level because I, this, you're right, this is only one component um, to really impact student outcome. Mr. Lackner, finally. Well, it, it almost feels like you'd like it both ways. Um, we're gonna spend a lot of money on the resources and you're arguing that the resources are not the only answer. I wanna offer a couple of observations. We've talked about um, illustrative math and the impact that that will have on the standard program, you open the presentation with um, a curriculum or a route map for students. There's an awful lot of shifting in diagonal uh, vectors on that map. Uh, what advantages do we face or disadvantages do we face in having different tools and techniques, knowing that students will be swapping in between if that route map is right, in having one um, standard tool set for the honors program in a totally different approach for the standard program. Help me understand that. Sure, and those diagonal movements really are to allow those students who want more challenge to, to move up or a student to um, look at their, you know, as they progress through the system and the rigor of courses, they might decide that honors math is not. So we wanted to make sure that we provided opportunities for students to move within um, our honors and standard level courses. Um, in terms of our next steps that was highlighted, that's one thing that we would um, we need to do is that scope, really aligning that scope and sequence to allow for that movement to happen. Currently, our honors and our standard levels um, are not do not have the same scope and sequence. So if a student were to move down to a standard level or a student were to move from standard to honors, they would either repeat or miss content. And so that alignment between those two um, is critically important to allow for our students to have that flexibility to move within the pathways. Does that make sense? I understand what you're saying, but it, it's unclear to me still how having two separate publishers toolkits in each of those tracks um, 
would aid in that movement. In fact, it seems it would exacerbate the problem of missing or catching up. Well, both, I keep going back to the standards. So both resources are aligned to the standards. So regardless of whether they're in standard level or honors level, they are still getting the same curriculum. They're still getting the same standards. Um, so the resource itself, we did talk about the difference in, in that movement between, um, and the teachers felt very strongly that um, Envision met the needs of our honors and IM meets the needs of, of standard level. So let me ask, uh, let me shift from the student outcomes to the budget impact and ask the question whether or not, given that uh, McGraw-Hill was represented in the honors track evaluation as well, whether or not there are any purchasing synergies in buying tool sets that were maybe the McGraw-Hill illustrative math honors toolkits. Were there any implications there? I'm not sure I understand your question, Mr. Lackner. Well, you're buying two different tools, one for each track. And what I'm asking is whether or not buying each of those tools from a singular publishing house would provide a buying advantage. Um, I would, I can't say with confidence, but I would say that's probably accurate. If we were to go with McGraw Hill, that you know, the more you buy, the more significant potentially the discount may be. Um, but I, I, I don't have those numbers, but I would assume, but again, I would want to get confirmation from the publisher for that. Then I would ask the follow-up question, which is if that's the case and we feel comfortable with one or the other, shouldn't we examine the gaps of each program in the other track? So what I mean specifically by that is if we were to select illustrative math and we were then to look at the cost advantage of using that in both tracks, what the performance gap would be between illustrative math and honors versus Envision or vice versa, so that we understand the trade-off that we're making for the differential price paid in buying from two publishers versus one. Sure, and I'd be happy to work with the publishers to get what that cost would be for all of our students. Um, I just don't have that information available. Could, could, I, could I just ask a clarifying question? So what you're really talking about is um, if, if we look, if we have three resources that a, the CDT is looking at um, and, they, and they have the same publisher, would there be gaps that we would have to look at with, I'm not sure, I'm very articulate. I'm not, I'm not sure what, how she answered your question was what you were asking. You, you were look, you're, you're looking at efficiency as, um, as well as um, increasing performance, right? So if we can save some money with a publishing company and still be able to um, close the gaps between performance. Is that right? In part, what I'm suggesting is that we, we ought to be thinking about the differential cost between the two programs and what trade-off we would be making in performance outcomes for that cost. And so if we were to combine and that created a cost advantage, I would like to understand how much performance we would be trading off in order to get that cost advantage. What it feels like today is that we have two different providers, which provides us no cost advantage, and we're unsure of what the performance output will be on either. And so what I'd rather be in a position to do is to say, we expect the performance, if we were to select one provider to be X, if we select two providers, we expect the performance to be X plus 10 or X plus something. And so in that instance, it's a little easier to, to understand the reason for selecting two different providers. At the same time, um, I'm uncomfortable with the conversation that we've had associated with the Envision program and its position in Pearson's stack of capabilities and our use of it as the honors track. Um, it just seems unclear to me why we would select in such a way. Now, I, I'm certain the team has done quite a bit of diligence and there, are, there is a rationale for it I have yet to understand, I've yet to see enough to understand what that rationale really is. And when I couple that with the idea of the fact that we're selecting two different tool sets and we can have students switching in between and we have a challenge set of declining numbers and we only get to spend these dollars once, I feel quite uncomfortable. Okay. 
I'm going to actually talk a little bit about illustrative math first. We did, we were given a, a target that was supposed to be hit and we were supposed to discuss, which is why I voted yes for one year only rather than three. Um, I, I didn't even see that discussed in the slides. Um, and I didn't actually see any data presented in the slides. Um, and so not even, I, I didn't even see anything uh, maybe local. Dr. Warren, you just discussed something that was potentially a correlation, um, but I feel like we, we didn't even get to what we, we certainly didn't make that number uh, this time. So, um, but we need to go back and we need to look at what that number, the target was, where we're at, and did illustrative math. Was there any progress? Because we do have some data, there are fall scores, um, in PSAT, and we do have scores, not ideal, but a fall fall to spring look. Is there some sort of progress along the way with illustrative math? Um, I didn't see any of that. I am not comfortable with a, a, a three-year contract without seeing any data whatsoever, um, because that was the only thing, was that really that guarantee of improvement. And so I don't know. I don't know where we're at with um, Would you like me to respond to the yeah, data sure. question, Ms. Parker? Um, so we are currently in our first year of implementation. Um, and so we don't have last year's data, um, as we know, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. But um, we do have um, our local assessments. We do have some local information. But we haven't finished the scope of implementation for that year one. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, our Freshmen are taking the PSAT tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, if my memory serves me right. Um, so we will have that fall um, to spring um, comparison to provide. We just don't have that data available. That was the one um, one of our benchmarks that we had presented mm -hmm. to the board last year, really looking at that growth. Um, and I believe we presented and, and COVID hit and um, it's been there since. So we don't have last year's data set, but we can certainly look at fall to spring this year once the freshmen complete that. Um, typically it's our freshmen. So we wouldn't have our, um, eighth, the hard part is we wouldn't have our um, accelerated or AT students um, in that algebra count, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. um, because they are not taking um, the PSAT. So we would be removing um, our top students um, to look at well, I would think that if we're looking at the data, we really need to look at, because right now I am is only standard. So I think that that's fine to do uh, rather than inflate the scores um, with you know, your top performing students who are going into geometry, honors geometry the next year. Um, so that's definitely something I, I would like to see right, right away. Um, and then we talked a little bit about standard versus core, but I did notice that in the board recommendation, or not board recommendations, the um, resource recommendations uh, that was a few pages long, it went through the resources that were being replaced. There's an error on the geometry, on our geometry. Um, it does say that um, the art of problem solving was the board approved curriculum. I don't believe that's correct. I believe that that text was only used at North uh, and it wasn't the board approved text. I believe that the board of text was uh, discovering geometry, just like the Algebra 2 one, um, same series. I would have to pull that. His, that was prior to me. I just pulled from the current list, but I could okay. certainly confirm what that resource is for honors geometry. This is important, I think, because knowing where we're really coming from and what is being, what the resources, resources are being taught, that are being taught from, is really important because the truth is, is that that, uh, that other text was, I mean, I had a kid in honors geometry, was never even touched, opened, or looked at. It was copied packets from um, whatever, what the standard is, which is, uh, is it connecting core? Is that, is that the right one previously? So it was just copied packets and didn't even have the resources that, the meager resources that came along with that particular text. Um, so I think this, that while resources is it's 
research is just one part of it. The truth is, is that it is such an important part because the students have to utilize this and the teachers have to utilize it. Um, I feel like we're just, we're kind of, we don't even know where we're coming from, so we know where to get to. Um, and I don't want that to happen again where we, we get to a point where everyone is just using their own stuff, whatever they want. Um, previously, the big words were the collaborative. It's gotta be collaborative, gotta be collaborative. And, I'm, and I keep hearing problem solving, you know, the, the problem-based learning. And that should be a part of what we do, but I don't want to hang all, you know, all of everything on that. I want to make sure that there is a blend um, because that's where a lot of our kids are getting stuck is that they're teaching each other and having high schoolers teach each other the entire time is not what I want to see. Um, so, you know, I don't know where this falls in that. Um, I didn't ask those questions. I know it's problem based as well. And it just says so in the brochure. Um, so I don't know if you have kind of a an answer to that piece of it about whether or not is this more of the same are we getting or I've experienced the packets as well. Um, and so the, the nice thing about having a, a common resource is that it does help. Again, I keep using the words alignment, but it, it doesn't help us and guide us to make sure that you know, if I'm an Algebra 2 teacher, that I know that there's been some consistency in the geometry regardless of the teacher that they had when they come to me in Algebra 2. Um, so it does help provide that foundation. Um, I don't know that I can answer that with any kind of, of definite um, response, but I'm hoping, I shouldn't say hoping, we need to be aligned. We need to be um, to make sure that we are teaching the standards and preparing students for the next level of mathematics. Um, it is currently, um, you know, through walkthrough data that we did um, over not this current school year, but in the two previous years of just what our, our teachers doing. And, and you are right. I, I credit our teachers for, um, for identifying that maybe the resource that was currently approved was not meeting the needs or was not aligned. And so they did work together collaboratively um, to develop all these packets, because that's what they are, um, those units to better align. Um, having a resource rather than our teachers having to go and find and supplement, um, and as um, Mr. McNally was saying, and keep reaching and pulling from everything, to have a common resource that has the tools that they can work with in that system rather than having to go out and find and create um, actually makes it more user-friendly um, for our teachers to be able to meet the needs of their students by not having to pull from a variety of different resources. Okay, I have... Okay. Um, when I was talking about the, you know, the kind of the scattered resources, and and um, I think we're, I think we've heard that echoed a few times now. Um, my concern was less, I think, with like, for example, the illustrative math, or illustrative, however you pronounce that, um, the illustrative math, for, but but with the envision, because I want to make sure that whatever it is we're using has the appropriate resources so that so that that's not happening and, and that seems like it's a bigger issue at the honors level and i'm not sure if that's what you're saying as well i and i, I don't want to speak for you but it sounds like we're kind of saying the same thing that it's that when we hit that envision that's where we're really seeing the issue although um it, it sounds like teachers have been doing that with with other courses as well with the other level as well and that's um you know where it has to happen i understand it has to happen at the moment but if we see that as an issue i want to i want to correct and and streamline that so that that's not occurring could i jump in just if we have planning part of instruction is planning and design and if we have plcs i'm going to put this in here who have early release work, we're not aligned yet. It doesn't matter what resource we get. We could get all the same resource from the same publisher. And if teachers are not consistent in their planning and design, 
that that's a concern. I believe they worked really hard at the beginning of school to give us some data with their PLCs. I think that's where the work really goes. I, I agree that consistent, I agree about the resource being consistent, but if we're not holding, and, and unfortunately, things will be taken out of context. I believe our teachers work really hard. I believe our teachers care about our kids. I believe our teachers want our kids to be the best they can be. I totally believe with that. But if our system is not looking at where the root cause of the, of the student learning problem is, we're gonna keep spinning our wheels. And if one teacher isn't using the resource because it doesn't fit into that instructional practice, then that means that whole PLC should be talking about it, bringing it to L&T, bringing it to the principal to say, this isn't working. So it isn't a group of seven people who aren't math experts making, making comments in public about teachers. So I guess that's where my concern is, is are we, are we digging deep enough to what really has to happen for kids to be learning? And if I, I may have mis, misspoke or been misunderstood, when I talk about really that misalignment, it, it was more or less in that shift from the ACT to the SAT. Um, our teachers are consistently using um, the packet, so there is that common experience for our students. Um, so I just want to make sure I, I speak to that. I'm talking about more of the misalignment in terms of preparing students for the way the SAT asks questions in mathematics, which is very different than the ACT. I believe Dr. Herman wanted to jump in. No, I was just going to add, um, I think this points to the, the need for the implementation person, TOSA, to be coaching teachers as well as we have both of our assistant principals from the two high schools who served on this CDT and who are here tonight in support of this recommendation, who also very strongly will be uh, monitoring classrooms and making sure that teachers are teaching the curriculum that we purchase. And, and, and I'm sorry, and it isn't an accountability issue in my head. It is, it's about meeting the kids' learning needs, which is, I'm sorry, it's about instruction. So just walking through, they need modeling, they need feedback, they need to make their practice public. And I'm hoping that's the direction we're going because if we're not, we're not giving our teachers the support they deserve to do out their best work. And I know that the resources are in your hands only for a short time this evening, but there are built-in instructional strategies and routines into those programs to really support those shifts that are needed to deliver. Um, so that is a, and they are clearly outlined um, in the resources. Now on that note regarding teachers, that, that's, you know, that's clearly what I'm, I'm looking for when you mentioned PLC, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's, that's kind of what I'm talking about is, is the teachers are, they're spending their time trying to figure out where does our, where does our, the stuff we're using, where does it fall short? And what do I have in my own bag of tricks to, to fill in there? And that's, I, I don't want them to have to come up with a bag of tricks. I want, you know, if we're going to buy a program, I want to buy a program that has that bag of tricks with it, that, that's going to fill in and that's going to provide for those various levels and for the various problems, things that are going to come up, come up so that the teachers aren't saying, you know what, this doesn't meet the standard. I want the curriculum that's going to meet the standard. And then, you know, I agree that if, if teachers stick to the curriculum, if we have a good one, good things happen and we'll have good results, but we have to have a, a good solid curriculum that's comfortable and that, that has all of the resources. And as, a, as I said, I'm still a little concerned with the envision at the honors level. And that's really where my biggest focus is right now, but the envision at the honors level that I don't know that it has those resources aligned with the program itself. That's where, and on another you know, real quick, you had mentioned in-house data other than, than like the SAT. What other in-house data do we have that we might be able to use to compare? Not to give Mr. Chizar too much more work, but 
Um, we have are giving um, common local assessments across the district. So our all four of our secondary schools are administering the same exams for illustrative mathematics. Um, it is the first year of implementation, so we could provide those numbers, but you know, to make sense of the impact that it's having, um, you know, that's where the PLC conversations are coming in as we make that shift to more performance tasks of sitting down with samples of student work and that iterator reliability and talking about what they should see um, on those assessments. So that's taking place. Um, we just don't have any comparable data um, at this time, but like I said, um, the SAT PSAT, I'm sorry, will be um, administered to our freshmen tomorrow. Um, so we would have that fall um, to spring, and I'm hoping that um, Mr. Shazar, I'm not sure where he's at, that we'd be able to, to pull out those students that took both that are currently in algebra to see um, the difference in those, um, those students enrolled in algebra as freshmen. Uh, we just don't have that data available. But the other one was our local assessment data um, that we have been um, administering across the district. We got that from last year as well, uh, the local assessment, the in-house. Um, we, we do not. Um, we were not giving um, district-wide common assessments last year. Um, there are, um, within the PLCs within the schools, I would say that that existed, but not district-wide. So I, I do have a few more things. Um, I, I do want to say, I like an Envision Math for standard program. It has a lot of bells and whistles. It really is great for students and for um, and for teachers. But it is standard, and that was my concern about it. In fact, I would be happy to see it, you know, K through AGA standard, um, being very clear. It, that would be great. If, I, if you came to me with that, I would be fine with that as a standard. The problem is it's not it's not rigorous enough for honors, and I I don't know what needs to be added because I haven't done that research. What would need to be added to make it have that rigor? Um, it does have additional components that you discussed about these additional standards that it covers that IM doesn't cover. So in that way, it is better. I mean, we're getting we're getting better. Let's, I want to get all the way there is what I'm thinking in my head. Um, and I know that I wasn't alone in this, but board members asked that we really look at what the best performing schools in, in this state, not in Michigan or California, but in this state, what are they doing and how can we parallel what that is and how can we make sure that we're choosing resources that at least, I understand some of them are using resources that are out of print currently, um, but I will say there has to be some something that it parallels that. There has to be something that's equal to that we can put together and we can make sure that we're using best practices or practices that actually get results on our state assessment, which is SAT, obviously. Um, because my concern is, is we adopt another standard program for our honors and then our best performing kids aren't exceeding enough or getting scores or aren't able to compete with students that are coming from the Chicago land area. They're not getting into the schools or not getting into the programs they want to get into in those schools. And then also they're not getting the scholarships because they can't compete with their scores. I mean, that, that's important for our best performing students. It's, it's important for our, our students who are on standard level as well but now we're talking about, let, we have to bump up the, the line. Um, and this isn't another component. I know that this is another component in our scores increasing, right? Now, I can't control the PLCs because that's, that's not my role here. Their importance, I get, and I, I really do understand that. However, we do control the outcomes or we're responsible for the outcomes and we do control the resource approval. And that's, that's how we can act. So we need to make sure that this is really the right way to go. Um, I don't know, I feel like both because I think it's for a standard course and I don't know what else needs to be added to increase that rigor. Um, and I'm not, I didn't hear that here. Um, I also think because the, this isn't paralleling what the best districts in the state are doing. Um, I saw quite a few districts who are using it, some for their standards, maybe a few for their honors here and there. But I didn't see necessarily 
the best performing districts. Um, I know that you mentioned Glenview, that's a K district. Um, so, but she clarified that that was that was not an apples to apples. That was the right. older mm -hmm. version of resources. So, I I was glad. But to, I think it just to needs that. to. I think it needs, and because it, it doesn't also parallel that same rigor, I think it just needs to stay here a little bit longer in the committee, and maybe we need to get that information, um, both about IM and Envision, get some more information, and and maybe have some time to process it and discuss it. I think that's where it needs to stay. I don't know where you're thinking. I, I actually, when, when Mr. Lackner made the comment that you know we only get to spend these dollars once, um, and, and I've said this since before I was on the board about uh, the decisions that are made maybe too quickly sometimes, is the kids don't only get to spend that year once. And I, I don't, I don't, if we go down the wrong path, I want to be feel comfortable we're on the right path because when we go down the wrong path, the kids can't come back and repeat this. They they only get one shot at, at at doing it right the first time. So I'm right now not terribly comfortable. I'm not sure how the rest of you feel. So well, I think our recommendation would be to take some of the questions that you've asked tonight and have the learning and teaching department and the teachers look at it again and maybe bring back some answers to those questions, any additional data that we have available to help with that decision you've mentioned a resource that i'd like us to look in, into a little bit closer to make sure that we vetted that in my preliminary look at that resource it looks like it's supplemental only it's not listed as a core resource so mm -hmm. we need to better understand um, what that is so i think that those are good questions and i understand the direction the board wants the team to take so i think uh, coming back maybe in may to learning and teaching again with some additional information would be would be best. Could you also, as part of that, please include not just the scope of the resource, but also what is the plan to address the high school math program in general? What things are we doing differently with instructional practices uh, and all of the other elements that you think will address our outcome today of declining scores? And I think all of those things are very valid. I also think we have to recognize what the change process really looks like from an instructional standpoint. And it does start with the resource, but then it also talks about shifts in instructional practice. Those are never one year implementation cycles or curves. And I think anything out there that's, that talks about the change process would tell you that it is a three to five year shift. And we're not going to see immediate results um in, in in supporting all of the things that have to happen to 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 see that change happen we are seeing some immediate results in some of the things that we're seeing on a small scale with our student performance and i think middle school is a really good place to look because that's one group that several years ago identified math as an area of focus for them they went through and adopted illustrative math as their core resource they went through and did some work with their instructional practices and now that they've been implementing and Ms. King, is this the third year or second year? Third year. We're seeing some significant shifts in student performance. And I would be willing to bet that we have students that are outperforming our ninth grade students at the eighth grade level in mathematics because they're in illustrative math. So I would encourage us rather than have a short vision for what the change process looks like with math, that yes, we should adopt a rigorous resource. Yes, we should expect that we have instructional practices that change in our high schools, but we also have to be realistic in our timeline for what that, that looks like in that process. That, that's true, but then I would expect we should be able to draft a, a three or five year cycle, improvement cycle on what it's gonna look like. Because what I'm hearing is that really the freshmen, current freshmen have the best opportunity to have the impacts and be affected by these changes. So those that are in higher levels of high school, uh, I mean, we, we have a gap. Yeah, no, and I, I think we all agree that that's the case. And I certainly am happy to bring that forward. But when I hear us talk about adopting illustrative math last year in May, in a pandemic and expecting us to have results in April of this year that would suggest there's been significant change. I don't know that that's a reasonable expectation for having the data to show that for, for a one year shift. I understand that that's what we had hoped and committed to, and it's certainly something that we want to look at, but I also wouldn't want to, let's say we see marginal improvement. I wouldn't want to abandon it at this point because I don't know that we've had enough time to implement it well. 
uh, to know whether or not it, it, it's a it's a uh, the right resource. I think what we see at the middle school in the performance certainly suggests that it's a good resource. Uh, external group has rated it as the highest of any resource that's available for standard level math. It's aligned with the Common Core standards, and those were some of the issues that we were having with our math curriculum previously. Was that we didn't have a a, a resource that was well aligned. And so now just the alignment piece is step one. The instructional practices will follow. And then also the assessment practices, making sure that our teachers have really good data about where students are in their performance in a formative way so that they can make shifts in their instructional practice in the moment, as opposed to post-mortem, which is what many of our assessments in education, particularly at the high school level have been um, for high school. And so supporting the PLC process using the formative assessment data in a way that the teachers can make those shifts. Looking at something like Alex, which I think is beginning to give us good information about student performance, all of those pieces are critical to the process. So I appreciate you saying, give us the whole picture. Mm -hmm. It's not just the resource, but what are all the other pieces that will go in to support our students? And what could we expect or should we expect to see in one year, two years, three years? So yeah, thank you for asking that question. And we certainly can do that. And, I, and just from my standpoint, I recognize that we may not hit uh, the final goal after one year. And I, and I appreciate that. That's not what I heard. So I think, at least for me, I just would like to see the data because to me, marginal improvement shows we're moving in the right direction compared to what our historical results are showing. So I just want to clarify, you, you weren't really, you didn't have a concern about illustrative math so much no. okay I, I, I didn't i just wanted to make sure no, that, that was me because i didn't um what i said was i didn't see any data and that was a concern for me but uh, i would assume that we we would want to see a little bit of progress i mean because i know that the number that was thrown out um i would think we would want to just know that we're running towards that target um you know in this obviously this year was strange but um I, I would think that the students have been many students and even if we pull out students that whose attendance or what, whatever we want to say whether it was remote or it was in person but attendance has been you know consistent um to just look at whether or not the impact was there uh, that would be important for me otherwise if we we really can't do get that um well enough you know that data out um then i'd say that you know three years is too long to commit to what well, we have to go one year again um, so we can get some data so are you um, I, I think what dr pearson's suggestion is uh probably best that we, we kind of revisit this in may after getting answers to really a myriad questions so um and if anybody has any additional ones, because we've only been discussing this for just one one tac very tactical issue around calendar. We'll look at it in May um, again, and then we'll go potentially to a, a board vote after that. Is there a drop dead day from a planning perspective for the curriculum learning and teaching team to say we've made an approval and we can affect next next um, academic year? Some of the training dates that are scheduled are in early June. So that would be a, a challenge. We may need to reschedule some of those training dates with the publishers. Is it possible to add this to a different meeting? I, I mean, we could, but I guess we're, we're gonna be right back at learning and teaching pretty quickly here. I guess my concern is I want to be able to give it the time that it needs and it sounds like it's an important topic that you want to continue to unpack so um, i want to make sure our team has enough time to put the, the, the information together and i want to make sure you have enough time to discuss it so i'll be that that doesn't really answer the question so is there a drop dead yeah, date well so that we have to have a decision by let's the summer is we straddle two two budget years right so um, we often find ourselves in a situation where because of publisher, publisher timing or delivery of, of materials that we have to shift um, from one year to the other of, of how, when, how we pay for um, those resources. I think from a professional learning standpoint, the later we wait, 
the more challenging it is to make sure we have the right people here to support the, the staff and the, the days allocated. Um, we certainly can go ahead and block out those, those times. There, there will be instructional practices that transcend any of these resources, as opposed to understanding how that particular resource supports the instruction. So it would just impact the prioritization. I would say if we get much past the May meeting and we still need more time to make a decision, then we're probably talking about needing maybe another four. Would it be possible to think about scheduling a special board meeting following the LNT meeting? Um, only because this is so important. So if we have the LNT meeting and maybe following um, a, a policy meeting or something that's at our business services meeting, we could have a special meeting to vote on it. I think that if we, if you feel comfortable after the May LNT meeting, it would be very helpful for um, Dr. Warren and myself to, to know the direction going forward so we can uh, instigate the, the purchase and verify that the professional learning is going on I, I don't i don't think we can answer that until the new board is seated okay um the only thing i would ask though in, in whatever format we ultimately decide can we get the presentation prior than the day of uh that's, so that we have time to review that's something i would just ask really on, on pretty much everything we do is is um and I, i'm probably beating the same drum i've beaten for a lot of years but um, the more time we have with material, the more time we have with, with data, the, the more clear our, even if, if we don't know what we're, the more clear our questions can be, if nothing else. So, but um, I think there are a lot of things that were mentioned tonight that if we had the data ahead of time, um, it might have it might have made this go a little more smoothly and a more, little more quickly, so. If I could just add one piece, the other thing I want to um, take into consideration that while our teachers are off for the summer, we know we have committed dedicated staff who are going to work to prepare for the fall. Um, it would be ideal, right, in a dream world that they would have the resources and the tools prior to them leaving, rather than coming back in August to something brand new. So just again, to keep that on our radar about when our teachers leave for the summer, summer um, to have some of those answers would be kind of yeah, in fact, I would, to Mr. Lackner's question, I would say that the the drop dead date would be somewhere between now and the May meeting. I mean, that's, that was kind of the, the question that was in the back of my head as well. And I would say that, yeah, we, we definitely have to, um, just like we want to have data in, but we should make sure they have the materials they need to perform their job in a timely manner as well. Could I just interject also, one of the things we talked about as a board in terms of our own behavior and actions was to have no surprises. I think it would help the presentation if you know um, about uh, or you have questions ahead of time to at least let the presenters know so that we don't spend a lot of time. It's a quarter to eight and we spend a lot of time on, this has been a very healthy, good discussion but I think it would have helped to have maybe some of those questions been given to Dr. Warren ahead of time so she could bring it to the board with the material, with the information so that that way our discussion doesn't linger on for a longer period of time. That's something we had talked about as a, as a group. So I, I would encourage board members to submit their questions ahead of time. We are to receive those answers as a whole group and we should talk about it at the board table, but it will help our presentation. I think as co-chair here, um, this was a month we did not have an agenda setting meeting. Um, and so this was a surprise um, as much as uh, we, I, I saw the end result the same time everybody else did, the public did, I had no inkling of the direction we were going. So unfortunately, um, I think this is just one that's, we've just got to get more information on. Okay, I think we've probably beaten that one to death now. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, <laughs> all right, you're, you're now free. That was your three for the night, right? <laughs> okay, next up is all day kindergarten, item D on the agenda.
Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight I have with me um, Mrs. King as we go through some of the all day kindergarten and half day kindergarten data. She'll be um, supporting us with that information. So the following presentation is a continuation of the business service meeting. At the business service meeting, we looked at the budget impact of eliminating the all day kindergarten fee. Tonight we'll share additional research and data related to the half day and all day kindergarten. Oops. This presentation is aligned to the strategic commitments of innovative learning and responsible stewardship, as well as the school board commitments of providing learning opportunities responsive to the whole child. It also aligns with policy 6 colon 10 and policy 7 colon 10. Children enter kindergarten with various experiences and skill development. During their kindergarten year, teachers observe and assess the skill development in different areas, with one of those areas being social emotional learning. SEL competencies that are taught, modeled, and practiced include self awareness and regulation, decision making, and building relationships with peers and adults. In addition to building their social emotional competencies, students also begin to gain proficiency in future ready competencies or the soft skills, such as teamwork and problem solving. The teaching of these skills supports students in school and in their work and play beyond the school day. Last but certainly not least is the development of math and early literacy skills. This includes numeracy, number sense, shapes, as, as well as phonological awareness and phonics, comprehension of text and vocabulary. As a reminder from our last presentation, currently parents have the option of an all day kindergarten or a half day kindergarten program. All day kindergarten is a fee based program, currently $2,025 for the year. If a family qualifies for a fee waiver, their all-day kindergarten program fee is significantly reduced to $90 a year. In addition, we provide both Title I funds at Anderson and Davis to support um, students that have a fee waiver, as well as we also have use district funds to support other students. So we, um, the existing research on all-day kindergarten elicits four main themes, which are highlighted for you on the slide. The first theme is that all day kindergarten helps close the achievement gap, especially for English learners and economically disadvantaged students. The second theme indicates that longer school days support more individualized instruction, while the third and fourth theme highlights benefits for social emotional learning as well as the opportunity for learning application that all day kindergarten provides. For students who, that attend a half day kindergarten program, this additional time for play, child initiated activities and social emotional learning development can occur in other settings and experiences. To compare the achievement of half day kindergarten and full day kindergarten students, we analyzed the kindergarten fast bridge data from 2019-20 and also the first grade iReady data from 2021. From the data available, there's no difference between half day and all day kindergarten students in math performance. From the data available, there are some differences between half day and all day kindergarten students in reading, but we cannot attribute those differences to being in half day and all day kindergarten. In reading, all day kindergarten students slightly outperformed the half day kindergarten students. SEL data show the difference between half day and all day kindergarten students in both fall and winter. Little difference. We also um, surveyed our families um, whose children attended half day kindergarten during the 1920 school year. We received 57 responses out of approximately 83 households. As you can see on the screen, 67% chose half day because they thought it was the best for their student 
and 33 chose half day due, due to one or more factors such as cost or child care. On each screen as we go forward, you will see some of the comments that represent what we heard from our parents who completed the survey. We then asked the individuals responding that a factor contributed to their decision of half-day kindergarten some additional questions. When asked if the fee was a factor, 100% surveyed said yes, and were given an opportunity to provide additional feedback, some of which I've included here. This is the 1920 half-day kindergarten families. All, all the slides will be from that group of individuals. And, and but this would be of the 33% yes. that said, I chose half day for cost or whatever, right? Yes, we okay. took, and so the next couple questions will just be for from that group of parents. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we asked the question, was the availability of before and after school care a factor in enrolling your child in half day kindergarten? And as you can see, 84% said, no, that wasn't the factor. On this one, we, this is all families answered this question that we sent the survey to. Um, we know this, that survey information cannot always predict what families will choose in the future. So we thought it was important for families who did not choose all day kindergarten to let us know what they would likely do in the future. As you can see, 14% would consider sending a child to all day kindergarten with a fee in the future, with 28% of the responses undecided at this time. One final question we asked all participants was if they had any additional information they believed would help the school board and district administration in reviewing the kindergarten options of the district. Examples of the responses are included here. So as we talked about at the business service meeting, eliminating the all-day kindergarten fee of $2,025 would have a budget impact of approximately $1.2 million annually. It would also ensure all students have equitable access to all-day kindergarten, allowing for the potential of accelerating both academic and SEL learning for all students. As we examine district practices and procedures through the lens of equity, we need to consider who is assessing accessing programs and who is not accessing programs. Further, we must question if our practices create educational disparities based on race, economics, or other factors. Whoops. If you'd like to consider other fee options, Dr. Chapman has provided you with other options and the budget impact. The budget impacts are based on the 1920 enrollment numbers. These options provide you with the opportunity to lower the fee with less impact on the budget. Dr. Chapman provided these options with the uncertainty of what guidelines will be in place and what additional costs might be accrued due to COVID-19 in the 21-22 school year. So on the chart, if you look at it, he um, provided that if we did no cost for free and re students on the free and reduced lunch and, and reduced for other families 180, it would have a budget impact of approximately $198,000. And um, then the next one is we would have for reduced in $90, but free would not have one. And that has a little lesser impact. There's also the option of having um, no cost for free and reduce $90 for all other families and that would have um, a budget impact of $725,000. And then again, of course, the bottom one is not having a fee and the $1.2 million that was talked about last time.
Okay, so um, comments and questions and where you would like to go from here. We'll start here this time because you got shorter the last time. I, I recognize that this is the learning and teaching uh, committee meeting. So I'll try to pose this in, in a learning and teaching way. 1.2 million over uh, five years, $6 million in recurring costs. What I'd like to better understand is from what programs would we take that budget? And when we decide to take that money from another budget, what's the negative impact on those students' outcomes for the impact that you describe here? Because we're trading off to declining budgets in one area to increase budgets in another. In the early part of your presentation, you suggested that the difference between all day and half day from an outcome standpoint is unclear at best. And so I'm, what I'm really trying to understand is what's the outcome impact of taking that $6 million over many years out of other programs in order to fund this? And, and how, how should we think about that trade-off in potential outcomes? So this is where I wish Dr. Champlett was in the room, but I know that he and Dr. Pearson have had conversations about this, but and because I had actually talked to him too, and it really lends itself to when we create the budget. There, we will look at the budget and we'll plan accordingly from that. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Pearson because I can see him getting closer to the mic. Yeah, so, you know, it's a complex question and a, and a fair one, right? It's, it's so we spend this money over here, so then it means we're not spending it somewhere else. But from a district perspective, I think when we, if you as a board prioritized all day kindergarten said that was important to us and we feel like that that's a, a, a benefit from an educational outcome perspective, um, then what we're gonna end up doing is start to look for ways to save that money. And of course we look first to operations and facilities and some of those kinds of things. $1.2 million um, is a lot in the household budget, but in our district budget, overall district budget, it's not a very large percentage. So. For example, when Dr. Chapman and I talked about it, perhaps we might purchase a bus a year later or some buses a year later. You know, every year we're looking at between 745 to, to a million dollars worth of, of bus purchases. So, you know, there's different things like that where we might elongate um, a, a timeline or we may wait longer on a facility improvement or it could very well impact um, st overall staffing. So it would just depend on, um, on kind of what, where we can find those savings. I, I would say we wouldn't necessarily be taking away another instructional program so that we could provide all day kindergarten, but we would first be looking to other places to try to, to, to balance the budget um, and save that. Save that. Of course, I understand that. And I, of course, we would always look to the, to impact uh, the classrooms last. At the same time, the budget, the total revenue while it fluctuates, it's not infinitely variable in an upward direction. And so what, I, what I'm fearful of is that every time we squeeze in a place, we're gonna have a budget problem poke out in another place. And so if we fail to have that kind of conversation around this issue, that $6 million over five years, um, it, it's, um, it really behooves us to say, what are the places where we think we would be able to change or to squeeze? And I think it, when we put up a picture like the one reflected here, surely the, the simple math of reducing fees equals, um, you know, reducing the budget impact. I think the challenge for us here is a little bit different than that. It's to say, what percentage of those people in that uh, bucket of folks who selected to avoid a uh, full day kindergarten did so exclusively because of the dollars. And if we look at that list, is there a price point that would include, that would be palatable enough? And so, you know, it's it's a um, it's a hair, it, it's a thorny problem. I see. At the same time, there's an awful lot of folks who have a willingness to pay, and so, you know, we don't have an infinite number of revenue sources. And so, while I don't see this as a profit center for us, it does become a cost center for us if we uh, follow a path like what's on the on the on the board here. And so, it just strikes me that knowing where we might take uh, before we make the decision is. Um, would be really, really helpful to make the vote really easy to say, yes, let's go all day because we can identify the bucket of money that we take this from. Um, 
no, that's that's okay. Um, you know, I, I think uh, half day versus full day, I think to me, the data shows it really is a very much a personal family choice in terms of how they'd like to, um, to educate their child. Um, I would rather, my preference would be to us approach um, that 33% that were not able to pay for all day kindergarten, but probably had the desire for all day kindergarten. And how do we do an outreach with them uh, to provide them resources, whether that's fully funding or, or whatever the scenario that we decide to allow their child to be in all day kindergarten versus reconstructing the program from a financial standpoint and making it free across the board. I'm not seeing a need to do that. Um, so that, that would be my thought. I'll jump in on this. Um, I know I would be in that, uh, in that group that, that said that half day was, would have been my choice, I think for all three of my children. I know there are other people that might say for one of my children, it would, you know, the all day would not have been a trade, but the, the, uh, financial aspect was not, would not be the major factor for me. However, um, as Ms. Fergery says, I, I think that's probably the most direct way to look at the problem is to say, well, what can we do about those 33% who are not thinking like I am, but thinking in a different way. Um, and if we can find a way to reduce the budget impact instead of making it $6 million and, and just using these numbers, you know, we can, we can get down to it being, you know, uh, under a million dollars over, you know, over five years, um, and using some other number set other than these. That's why I was kind of staring at the numbers and kind of trying to figure out about that very 33%. What could we do and where do they fit? And I was trying to figure out, it seems to me that the reduced is a somewhat insignificant, insignificant number. Free is a relatively it, somewhat more significant uh, number of people. And I'm going to guess that most of the 33% would probably come from that free group, if, if I'm not mistaken. And well, I'm not sure we know that because it could be from those people that do not qualify for the free or reduced and having that additional and are on that. And, a, you know, maybe a, one parent is working and one is, has determined to be the stay at home parent and so that's where the cost is and you know the data that from the um, survey has caused us to ask a lot of questions and those same exact questions how do we um, support more and make sure that all of our assistance in our office when you know when an, you know say an EL student comes in midway through the year are we making sure that we're looking into and offering them the full day be knowing that that is a group we feel that we have captured them for the most part because it's under 10 that we're in our half day kindergarten program. And we also have to realize all families, whether they're EL, whether they're on free and reduced, they may still want to choose the half day option for their child because of the many reasons we heard. So for me, I, you know, when we talk, because I know the word equity came up and this is, this is a, a uh, an expenditure on equity, if we can find what that sweet spot is, that's an expenditure on equity I think I could get behind. And I won't speak for anyone else, but I think that's how, where I land on this. Um, because we, you know, it, um, I understand, that I'm gonna guess that that's what about a half percent, the 1.2 million is, if I recall what our budget, it's about a half percent of our budget, am I right? So. I know that it's not significant in that regard, but it's still significant numbers. And, uh, you know, when we, we, when we were saving a certain of it, you know, in the tens of thousand on insurance a few years back, we were thrilled. So if anywhere where we can find ways to preserve our, our revenue streams and, and keep our, uh, you know, keep our budget intact, I think that's better. Um, I am for all day kindergarten being free for everybody, but I'm also a board member and try to be fiscally responsible. So I know doing that all at one time is not 
um, it is the only grade we have where parents have an option to go half day or full day. I commend our teachers, our half day teachers to be able to keep having taught both. It's not easy to do, so bravo to our teachers. I would like to see us um, look at reducing it because I do believe there are probably more families who can't afford the top number than I, I think our school district does its very best to get our low income families into all day kindergarten. It's the families who somebody has to stay home. Um, and so I, I would like to see us do something as a show of faith, um, good faith to our families who um, don't live in the, don't have that extra money, but really do um, believe in our school system and our schools. So I, I think that's what you were saying, Mr. McNally, that could we find a sweet spot where, or at least just start to slowly make that change. I, I, would, I would look to that. I have said a lot about all day kindergarten um, and this is important um, to me when I look at the amount. Yes, it sounds it does sound like a large amount. Um, Dr. Pearson did note that that percentage wise isn't a large amount um, in comparison to our entire budget. However, I look at the what a kindergartner is expected to do by the end of kindergarten has vastly changed. I think maybe a lot of people are thinking kindergartners are still coloring, singing songs and eating paste. I, that's not what is the outcome is at the end of kindergarten. And when we looked at a previous presentation where we have kids in tier two and tier three um, that are struggling readers and th those numbers are too large, we know by third grade, if a student isn't reading proficiently, that trajectory will continue to widen and become a larger gap. And that impacts our SAT scores down the line. So I think about that and how there's so much more our half day, I, I don't know how our half day kindergarten teachers really get it done um, in a half day. Are, just to clarify, are, we're obligated to provide half day, yes. correct? Yes. So, I don't know that the problem we're trying to solve for is whether we philosophically agree with all day kindergarten or not. That's not what I'm hearing. I think it's how do we reach because you already have 67% of the of the of our families that have their kids in all day kindergarten. So the question is, how do you reach the other? And I don't think I have that right. But 33% um, don't go because of financial. Right. Okay. The 67% were ones that chose yes. half day. That's right because they thought it was best for their child at that time. Yeah. So if half day, so if half day kindergarten goers, it's 33% of those people that are really are struggling to make the, and they don't make the choice because they can't afford it. Um, and it isn't, I know that it isn't all just one person staying home because we, we don't have all two parent families. So um, I think I would, I, I'm okay with taking a large step forward um, but I, I do think that eventually we need to really talk about getting to free all day kindergarten if that is your choice. Well, I'll, I'll kind of mirror what Mrs. Fairbrick said too. I don't think that the, uh, the two things, uh, the, the one I was noting that the, the math uh, half day all day are equal and there's what was termed, I believe an insignificant difference in um, and language skills. Um, so, not that I, that doesn't, that's still somebody's choice is somebody's choice. And, um, but I think that the question is how, how can we reduce the budget impact? And we're going to allow, and, and to allow people to have that choice. And so again, I'd like to find a way to hit that sweet spot where we can, and, and we, we probably, because these people don't come from any one of those three groups, I guess, you know, I, I was surmising where most might come from, but that you made a good point that, that you know, perhaps it's, so if we can find that, 
um, and, and that would involve a lot more uh, data analysis. But if we could find out where that is and, and find a way, and it, you know, I don't, this is maybe, I don't know about optional fees, but um, I guess who pays optional fees, but um, certainly um, if we can find some way to, to identify who it is that needs to help and, and provide that regardless of if they're free, reduced, or paid. One thing that we could look at would be some sort of a sliding scale similar to like FAFSA and some other. One option could be, in addition to the options listed there, would be to look at some sort of a sliding scale similar to how financial aid is awarded for FAFSA. Um, right now, we, the, the op, we made adjustments to our current model, but we could have free, reduced, reduced plus, <laughs> And then full, full uh, tuition. Um, I, I think that the minimum would be to have free and reduce pay zero. Most in most of our other fees, they are fully waived. This is one of the very few fees that we have where we do charge free and reduce students anything. Um, so I, I, I think that that knowing what we know now about the data and the needs of uh, many of our families, uh, I think that would be the minimum, but I might suggest the opportunity for us to bring back uh, an adjusted that has some sort of a sliding scale. It, it, it's more challenging because then we're um, going e even into more depth of families' financial incomes, but again, they have to, we, they would have to want to apply for that uh, fee waiver on a sliding scale, and that could be a way to get at that 33%. I would really, I would love to see what a plan like that would look like. I think that that solves a lot of, a lot of the issue. Okay. Yeah, I, I, def, I think that's a great idea um, to take a look at. I would fully support uh, no fee for free and reduced, just you know, on the table today. So. Anyone else with? All right. Well, it sounds like. This Can I is, just ask a question? Oh, Do absolutely. you want us then to bring? Would you like us to bring back a different fee structure then to like business services? Would that be the next step? That's what I was just going to say. Is it looks like we're going to probably have to do that in order to for people to feel what's, comfortable. What's the timeline on when you would be able to do that? I'm trying to gauge the timeline. We can do that with what families need to make decisions. Yeah, so I'm, your next business services is next Monday night, right? Correct. Yeah, so I I think we could probably have a scale, a, sli a sliding scale recommended by them. Okay. Okay. All right, then um, I guess we thank you very much. Um, and we will move on to renewals. Good evening. Tonight we're bringing forward five operational systems. These are all renewals, things that we've had for multiple years. Um, five of them, one of them is at Menem. It's a standard-based online learning platform. It's also used for credit recovery. Uh, FastBridge, um, this used to be uh, the universal diagnostic for our K-2 students. With the implementation of iReady, we've been reducing that number. It is now used as a tier two intervention for K-2 and up through eighth grade. Uh, AMP which is our, a module of Schoology. It's our local assessment system. We switched over to that a couple of years ago. ECRA, we are reducing that to one of the three modules we brought forward traditionally. Um, earlier, as you saw, some of the conversation about computer adaptive uh, elements and how they can bring a more personalized learning experience to students. That has really taken the place of some of the growth and look we've done. So we've realized that what we're seeing in that system is not necessarily needed. We're getting it in other systems, such as iReady. Um, and then the last one is the performance matters. And I apologize, we don't have the invoice for that. That is a system that we had. We replaced part of that with AMP, which was in Schoology. Through that replacement, PowerSchool bought everything. Um, and we were able to get performance matters, keep the module we're replacing as part of our transition. But that's not an on the books um, accounting process for them. And this year, as we were looking to get our 
an invoice for them. Um, they're unable to provide it at this time. We hope to have it. If we don't have it by uh, the time the board meeting rolls around, we'll, we'll pull that, but we should have it um, by then. But the price on there is the expected price of what that would be. Questions? Okay. Thank you. I think that's a consent item. Okay. And finally, item F, Title I School Wide Waivers for Anderson Elementary School, Davis Primary School, and Richmond Intermediate School. And thank you, Mr. Chisar. I apologize. We're trying to move here. That's right. Batting cleanup this evening. Um, so for discussion tonight, um, bringing forward um, Title I School Wide Waivers for Anderson Elementary, Davis Primary, and Richmond. Um, it's been, um, we've brought forward in terms of previous approvals, Anderson. So this is the first time we're having to bring Davis and Richmond for you. Um, so this falls under the policy related to the Title I programs. Relates to the strategic commitment of responsible stewardship. So in terms of the benefits of going school-wide for these particular schools, it allows us, um, the Title I schools, greater flexibility in how that Title I money can be spent. So with that, it permits all students to participate, permits all teachers and parents to participate, and allows the funds to be used to support instruction for all of the students. So it broadens the scope of how we are able to use those funds. So currently, this is the status of the buildings that are Title I in our district, and you can see the percentage of low income and their current status. So currently, Anderson, Davis, and Richmond have been operating school-wide. Previously, they had um, been above the 40% um, threshold that's required to operate school-wide without a waiver, um, and Anderson has been applying for a waiver for several years. And you'll see that Mun Hall is targeted assistance, um, and then that is because you have to be at least 20% or higher with your low-income students in order to apply for a waiver. So Mun Hall um, remains below that 20% threshold, and, and we are unable to apply for a waiver for them. So they must continue to operate school um, as a targeted assistance instead of school-wide. So just to reiterate, it does not change the amount of money we receive. It only changes how we can spend that money. Um, and we must submit a waiver annually for each of those schools if it falls below that 40% threshold. And so this is the first time that we've had to do that for Davis and Richmond. Um, and this waiver must be approved by the board, and we must then submit it to ISBE, who gives their final approval for the waiver. Um, and so just you'll see that you were included a copy of the waiver, and they had to address how they were going to intend to use those funds in a school-wide manner, and the educational benefits of going from targeted assistance to school-wide. Questions? Over here, over here. I think this is something we do every year. We're just expanding the scope on it this yes. year. So um, I would say this is a consent agenda item. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And I'll look to Dr. Herman for potential future agenda items. Do you, do you have anything currently? We have um, coming back to the board uh, in Mar excuse me in May will be the early release um, schedule for the elementary and middle school. We will also have bringing back the math, uh, the, all the questions and the data that you asked for. Um, those are the two main ones that we have right now for the May agenda. Oh sure, um, math. the math bringing back math tonight thank you <laughs> could could i add i have a couple of requests um for for both of you chair as chairs um the first one uh mrs mccabe had brought it before related to um, an equity audit uh with using iea as a resource i'd like to at some point get an update on that but then also i'm hoping that we're going to expand that to consider mm -hmm. other um, vendors, for lack of a better word, as well, so that we have a comparison. Um, and then the other item I had is um, we're coming up on May very shortly, um, and, and we're still a little bit fluid in terms of what next year will look like. So I feel it's important that we start as a board getting uh, socialized on what the plans are, what is in flux. And so I just think it almost should be a standing agenda item 
um, at several of our committee meetings, I, I think would be my suggestion. There's a rumor that the guidelines are coming out tomorrow. So, okay. um, and normally those rumors are true. So um, I would expect something coming out tomorrow. We hope to then be able to continue with, I agree with you, continue to update the board at future meetings on what, what we're doing. Okay, thank you. I think that's the reason because there was nothing today. I think that's the reason why we didn't have a superintendent's report today because there's nothing additional. But I echo that. I was that was something that was uh, concerned to me because I that's probably the number one question I get from people is what are we gonna be doing next year? And I kinda have to shrug. So the more we can the more information and I think it it um, I think it's helpful for everyone out there and I think it's helpful for all of us for people to see that we are working on it and thinking about it so okay um do we have any citizens comments for the end we do not so it is 8 22 and we can adjourn this meeting um and i believe we're going to be moving into another one Dr. Warren.
Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the special school board meeting on Monday, April 19th. It is 8.34, and um, can you call roll, please? Mrs. Barker? Here. Mrs. Fairgrave? Here. Mr. Lackner? Here. Mrs. McCabe? Here. Mr. McNally? Here. And Ms. Weibel is absent. Mr. Mannheim? Here. Thank you. Please rise for the pledge. Are there any citizens' comments? No. Nope. Okay. All right. That takes us to our item for discussions. Um, and we have uh, three firms tonight going to present to us. Um, they're allotted 20 minutes for the presentation tonight. And our first firm is FGM. So um, we'll get started. Let you guys introduce yourselves and go from there. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening. Um, before we jump in, we'll, uh, we'll uh, do quick introductions here. So my name is Josh Cerniak, and I will serve as your principal in charge. I'll also serve as your as your primary contact. And um, in, in addition to that, and more importantly, I will be responsible to the district for the, for the quality of the work uh, that our firm does, and to ensure that the full resources of, of our firm uh, is dedicated to or dedicated to District 303. Um, this, uh, this team before you tonight, along with the colleagues that we've identified in our qualification submittal, is the team that would serve uh, District 303. Um, that's, that's something that I think you'll hear as a recurring theme during our presentation tonight because we know in our work with uh, a number of school districts, uh, not only in the state of Illinois, but in some other areas of the country that having a consistency in the team that serves the school district is so important because it, it is imperative in the district architect role that institutional knowledge is developed with each project. In addition to that, the things that happen outside of the project with the district, not only in terms of your facilities, but your operations, and most importantly, your people. Um, as, as an alumnus of District 303, this, and, and, and still having friends and family that have students in the district, it really doesn't get any more personal uh, than that for me. Good evening. My name is Matthew Tepper. I will be your project manager. What that means is that I will be the lead person who will be climbing up on your roofs, who will be walking around your parking lots, and who will be looking up above the ceiling as well as attending all your meetings, making sure the projects or any delivery method is on schedule and keeping up with communication with the administration staff, teachers, maintenance, and anybody else that the district deems necessary for the project to roll forward, all within the proper communication chain so that everybody has got the right information at the right time. My goal will be to make sure that I understand the whys behind what the district wants and needs, as well as finding the strategy to best get with the best outcome from that with the least possible uh, problems or surprises along the way. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name's Mike Denz. I would be serving your district as design principal. And what that would involve is, is leading everyone through, all, all the stakeholders through the, uh, the design process and guiding them along the way. Peggy Hoffman. And I'm a design principal of FGM Architects, specializing in educational interiors. And I look forward to working with all of you to design spaces that support and inspire your entire learning community. We're going to address each of your questions in the same order that we presented them. FGM Architects is um, a firm believer in providing the same uh, employee support through uh, our hiring practices, employee training, and also our promotion practices. We're each on a unique path, but when we feel respected, we can all contribute greatly. 
FGM is an employee-owned firm, and that means that we not only benefit financially, but we each contribute and own our sense of business owning, that every project and every client is ours, and that we'll succeed together. FGM is committed to providing the tools and thank you, the tools and continued development to support every team member. In 2020, we celebrated our 75th anniversary. And one of the things we did was redesign our internet site so that every employee could have um, easy access to information and that we could foster this more open um, daily communication. We live this also by involving our entire project teams in our design discussions. We welcome input from every team member, no matter what level they are. The evidence is our strong employee retention rate. And we're very proud that over 50% of our architects achieve their licensure while they're at FGMA. We also mentor our protege firms, which are minority, women, and disadvantaged business enterprises. And we believe strongly in cultivating and growing these partners. We partner with school districts with a wide range of socioeconomic backgrounds. And no matter what size, we treat all of them with the same process, the same respect. We are the district architect for Cicero 99, Sycamore 427, and Highland Park 113. And while these are all very different districts, our approach to working with them is the same, always to partner to create learning environments that support lifelong learners. You know, equity is fostering listening and empathy. We seek to engage all stakeholders, administrators, teachers and faculty, community members and students to uh, clarify your needs throughout the design process. Some of our greatest joys are the design of non-traditional learning environments, such as sensory rooms, seeking to help students find the key to unlocking their own personal success. And we know that non-traditional furniture can really respect individual learning styles and provide for that success and create sense of community between students. And in terms of non-traditional curriculum, one of our favorite project types are career technical education learning spaces. And these are fantastic opportunities to support students who might not be on a track to a college or university. So of all the projects in the, the communities and districts that we serve, we look forward to working with you to provide equity to all of your students. I would like to speak a little bit about our lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, while the pandemic caused many challenges for the every district's uh, educational delivery model, as well as the design process that we went through, we feel that FGMA was able to transition a lot of these challenges into opportunities, as well as uh, new solutions for all of our district clients. Uh, on a company level, FGMA was able to, to really seamlessly transition to a, a social distancing working from home really remote scenario. All I really had to do was take my monitor home and I was able to remote back into my desktop station at work and have all the full capacity of all the programs and all the software and all the connections that I needed to have if I was in the office. This allowed to maintain consistent communication with clients with our partnered consultants and within our project teams within ourselves. Utilizing programs such as uh, Zoom, obviously we, we kind of jumped onto Zoom kind of before Zoom became a thing. We were piloting it and we just kind of rolled it forward. This offered a lot of possibilities for virtual meetings, for digital work sharing amongst our group, among ourselves, and it kept really the possibility for daily communication within project team members. FGMA also relies very, very strongly on our internal uh, design committees. Uh, one of those such committees that mainly focused on hazards and threats before COVID-19 was called our Resilient Design Committee. But while during COVID, it was a hazards and threats really mainly dealt with building security and occupant safety, and it mainly with storm shelters and those new requirements and laws that came into effect. But we were able to seamlessly transition a lot of that COVID response into that committee so that we could tailor 
very specific approaches for capacity studies for furniture layouts for our partner districts. And what this kind of helped to do is help them mitigate the conditions that were coming forward with their own facilities in place and, and, also, and also foster discussions that they knew that they were going to have to have with their teachers, with their staff, and with the general public. Um, some of the obvious lesson learned might not be so easily accomplished with increased social distancing in space. Every district kind of struggled with classrooms not being big enough. And if you can't build new, you know, you have to make do with what the existing conditions offer. So um, a lot of those kind of huddle zones, collaborative areas that are kind of already built into some of our design processes allowed some of that flexibility to kind of uh, fluctuate for some of those new spaces. But a lot of those existing spaces needed a little more assistance where flexible furniture really came into a, a, a play. So, and it's not just with student desks that could be individualized and clustered into groups that now can be separated, but that's a very key element to, to help foster moving into a, a, a scenario that changes kind of sometimes on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis. But some of those other strategies were also just with storage furniture. One of the biggest footprint Kind of hogs in a classroom space is bookshelves, storage cabinets, and, and, and wardrobes that are in permanent fixed positions. If those get transitioned into mobile storage elements, which in, in the room that we were waiting in, in the music room, had a lot of those mobile pieces, if the space needed to have more room for a higher priority of student capacity, those storage elements could get temporarily relocated out of the way to make way for the higher priority of getting two, three, four, five more students in an in-person learning situation, which we know is kind of a better approach or a more hopeful approach. To the um, and then finally, COVID-19 put a very strong magnifying gla glass on mechanical systems. Um, it was one of the biggest things, especially with the airborne pathogen, you want to maintain the safety of the staff and the students at all times. And air exchange, fresh air intake are, are all critical elements to that piece. We worked with school districts that potentially added in exhaust systems in classrooms so they could get return in a specific space for the isolation rooms that are required for nursing and all that. But then those can be remained in place and still be utilized after COVID pandemic passes, passes over. But one of the biggest, least intrusive uh, elements that we were involved with was with Salt Creek School District 48 where we added bipolar ionization devices to every single classroom unit and every single centralized rooftop unit and air handler. And this helps mitigate and neutralize a lot of those airborne pathogens, clumps them together and makes them large enough that normal filtration that you already have in place, the filters and the, the equipment and everything can capture more of that system or more of the, the, the pathogen. But these are, are, are devices that and get retrofitted into existing facilities, existing equipment, so it's not new things that have to be taking place. But the benefit also of this is after the pandemic concern might have dwindled away, and hopefully in the nearer future, um, those systems also still help with dust and allergens. So it can create a, a general indoor air quality uh, benefit even beyond COVID. So it's, it's a good value for a district to take in place because it's a system that can stay in place and stay running and still offer benefit to all the occupants. And, and I think that's the best thing that we're trying to look for is strategies that can be implemented as a short-term response, but then still can have a long-term use, you know, and added that really to the Okay, I'd like to speak a little bit about our research and information gathering process that we would embark upon with starting a new project or working with your district. Um, really, really from the onset, what we do is, is a lot of foundational things like gathering existing building drawings and, and specifications. And we also understand that uh, your district could have, uh, does have some older facilities where you may not have good existing drawings and we have the capabilities to do uh, 3D laser, laser scanning to capture all of the existing conditions in, in those buildings. Um, but more importantly, we would like to start to understand your existing building space utilization, what each room is being used for. So that as we start looking at uh, new opportunities, we want to understand the existing lay of the land, 
all the various spaces that could move around it as part of the project. Um, we do this with uh, obtaining a master schedule and understanding, especially with high school and middle school, where you're, you're based off of an academic period schedule, really understanding utilization. And we work with high school districts where um, they are underutilizing their space according to the guidelines of, of ISBE. And that allows us to find opportunities to repurpose existing space by making some, suge some suggestions to improve the, the scheduling in some of the schools. And this ultimately saves you, uh, save dollars too versus new additions at times. Um, more importantly, we like, we gather the, any master plan and facilities assessment uh, reports that you may have. We know the district has invested a lot of time and resources into developing a master plan, which is wrapping up here soon. We really wanna dive into that document and really thoroughly understand all of your goals and your objectives for your curriculum and your spaces and, and your, your operational plans uh, for the future and life cycles. Um, there we look for opportunities or, or synergy between the facility master plan and the master plan. Uh, to give you an example, they have uh, one of your schools may be uh, slated for uh, rooftop mechanical replacement soon, but as part of the master plan, there might be uh, some learning environment improvements that are also on the horizon be plan. Well, we will look for those opportunities so we can do them together, design and bid that work together to capture uh, some efficiency there with the cost. Also, part of this phase, we have a lot of conversations with administration about all the various stakeholders that should be involved uh, with the process. We understand all projects vary from size, complexity, scope, and we wanna make sure we have the appropriate stakeholders at the table. And typically with your larger projects that can include your administration, your staff, can include community and students. Lastly, we believe Teachers play the most essential role in developing successful students, but we also know that uh, space is really the tool that teachers and students need uh, to be successful as well. And we like to have conversations in the beginning about some of the intentions of these of learning environments as they relate to collaboration, critical thinking, uh, creativity, and uh, and communication. And from there, it will start to define the project and the parameters. But we also have an informal process um, that is part of a post occupancy evaluation. And we, when we get approval from administrators after a project's been complete, and students and teachers have been using uh, using a completed project, we want to sit down, have some conversations, understand what could be done better, what's working well. And that's an important piece in developing a relationship and building on our relationship and moving forward uh, to move. <clears throat> in terms of in terms of um, school district clients that have decided for one reason or another not to continue using our services, um, there, there's certainly lessons to be learned from that. Interestingly enough, or what we find interesting is that in most most cases. School districts tend to um, start working with another architecture firm because there's a change in the administration or on the school board and someone new that comes into your district may have a prior relationship with another firm. And so even though in those instances that, that stings because if, if we've been serving a school district client to the, the best of our ability, we understand that's, that's how the business operates primarily in uh, the PK-12 clients uh, that, that, that we serve. Um, but there's still a lot to be gained from that. And what we do is we, we still look, we take a hard look at ourselves in the mirror. And, and often in those occasions, what we found is that outside of each project, that maybe we didn't work doing the best job in terms of building a relationship with administration, with school board, to get a better understanding so that when the school district's priorities or mission changes that we're better prepared to handle those those um those situations and so we certainly apply that to the school districts that we have incredibly long-term uh relationships with these 
These are school districts that we've worked for not only 10 years, 20 years, some even 30 years. So we, we definitely uh, apply those lessons that, that we've learned from school districts who have decided to move on and, and really help fortify the relationships that we uh, have with the school districts that we continue to serve. That's, that's what a good teammate does there. I, I don't know if you, if you caught that, but it's actually my cue to continue on this next question. And as I stepped back, I got that look of going, hey, you're still up. <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Matt. And that's actually the, the hallmark of a great project manager uh, live, uh, live for you to see. So, um, so with regard to the fifth question that, that was asked uh, of, of us, in terms of monitoring efficiency, efficiencies and, and balancing cost control, uh, what we like to do at the, at the outset is sit down with the school district and take a look at the needs analysis that, that your team has put forward. And then we really look to see, is there anything that can be captured in terms of energy conservation or monies that are available through things like the Comet or NICOR uh, rebate incentive programs through the ISBE Energy and Maintenance Grants, through Illinois Clean Energy, just to, to name a few. And it, it, is, it is absolutely our obligation in serving you as a district architect to always have our finger on the pulse when it comes to any opportunities that allows a school district to, to really defer, and not really defer, but to, to spend money wisely on other things. And if possible, you know, if, if they're, is money available um, that, that the district is taking every opportunity to maximize the, the, the use of that, that public funding that, that's out there. Um, and so that's, that's, I would say, really at the outset and, and something that we, like I said, it's, it's something that's ingrained in, in our DNA in serving as a district architect. Needless to say, one of the major things in making sure to maximize efficiency just in the development of a project is communication all the way across the board. So it, it all starts with a dialogue of communication between us and the district and, and the district administration staff about where we are, where we all together and where we are going to go together. Um, and so a lot of the times that that transitions into, like Josh said, a kickoff meeting rolls into periodic, even weekly meetings when a project is in development. And, and this is all to ensure that we are heading down the right path and, and the right things are being put into the documents that need to be put into them, culminating with a final page turn with the district before they go out to bid so that everything is kind of noted and identified. This is, this is where this is going. This is how it's going to be coming into play. And then also understanding that how on the district side, it, it helps keep moving that forward. And then that carries through into construction, where we, we transition into periodic, oftentimes weekly again, uh, construction meetings that are out on site, field observations that happen at that same time, with the documentation to follow it up with. All of this is just to ensure that we have timely responses to RFIs, timely responses to submittals, timely responses to issues that need resolution now, especially during a summer construction window. There's not much time to to dawdle on, on things, we can, we can quickly make those uh, processes happen with the right decision, with the right uh, processes going forward. And that's kind of how we kind of maintain those kind of efficiencies. But one of the other biggest things that Josh has already mentioned as well is just consistency in the project team. You know, FGMA understands that St. Charles School District 303 deserves that kind of continuity, that kind of collaborative approach with their design team that is, it's gonna be there throughout all phases of the project, through all the duration of the project, through the entire relationship with the district. So going on to uh, quality control measures kind of relay into the same thing. The simple simple question or the simple statement about quality control is, is having the district you know, knowing what they're gonna get and getting then what they expect to get. And, and all of that kind of keeps happening through discussions to make sure that we are all on the same track, we are on the same page, we're understanding the things that are happening out in the field or on paper. Um, and then Mike will kind of continue on a little bit more about some of the digital means and some of the manual means that we have to kind of relay those things to make sure we're all on the same page. Yeah. 
quality control really starts with the and throughout the, you know, the entire design process. We have the latest technology and tools available to communicate with all the various stakeholders. Um, I mentioned uh, 360 photography a little earlier, and that's where similar to uh, Google Street View, where you're able to capture 360 degrees in a space. Our software is also able to produce rendered images in that same manner, and we're able to compare those side by side and really get into the detail and any of the design related scope for any sort of a renovation project. But we also have uh, the latest technology for producing renderings to explore finishes uh, and also animations, which are very much embedded in our design process to three dimensionally and graphically walk everybody through a space so they can fully completely understand all of the project uh, scope. A couple of us mentioned furniture, and we don't just think of it as a finishing touch, we think of it as a critical element for your student success. We offer design specifications and assistance with procurement for projects of any size you can imagine. And it's important to realize this final level of detail. And, and we do that by following through. Um, I want to, and what we do is walk uh, punch this with our client to make certain that what you intended and what you paid for is what you get. In, in closing, I want to go back to something that I said during our introduction um, and, and that I also said that, that we would touch upon as, as a, kind of a theme throughout the presentation. And that is to, to say again, this is the team that will serve District 303. And, and as a proud alumnus of, of the district, but even maybe more importantly, a product of the great engineering and architecture program at well, it was then what I still refer to as the St. Charles High School. Um, so, and, and a shout out, a shout out to Mr. Brown and Mr. Holderfield, who were both exceptional. And while not in the architecture and engineering program, I also have to give a, um, a shout out to one of the best English teachers to ever do it, Mr. Reed, who I understand is still a, a teacher in, in, in the district. Um, so, this is, like I said, something that is, that is personal to me. It's personal to our team. We are uh, a firm that takes an approach of service ab above all else in terms of what we provide to school districts, our commitment to school districts. The, the little things don't mean a lot to us. They mean everything. And, and we, we thank you for, for taking the time to, to here and learn more about our firm tonight. And at this time, if you have any additional questions, we'd, we'd love to, to hear those. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thanks for your time tonight. And thank you for your, the patience from our other meeting run later. So um, at that time, um, you guys are free to go. Thank you. Yep, thank you.
Good. Welcome. So, yeah, you ready? All right, welcome. Um, our next uh, group is DLR. And so um, we're allowing you about 20 minutes for your presentation. So whenever you're ready, feel free to introduce yourselves and get started. Yes, please, because it's being recorded and live streamed. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Is this all right? Yep. Okay. Uh, well, we're a DLR group. And my name is Dennis Bain, and I'm the client leader. With me tonight, it's a pleasure of mine to bring in the rock star group, if you will. My right hand person, Carrie Van Zandt, she's going to be your project manager. She's been doing a lot of work for us. She lives in Batavia, so she's literally 5.2 miles south of here, so 10 or 11 minutes, depending on the bridge in, in Batavia, how it figures there. And then with us also tonight is our lead engineer. John will be responsible for everything from energy modeling from to commissioning at the very end to make sure the building is operating and functioning as it was designed and as it should. And we'll start with us again tonight Melissa. The interesting thing about Melissa is she's research and an interior designer. So when you go through all of our information and you start looking at the design and the approach, looking at the inside out and the emphasis that we put on the learning environment in terms of applying the research to the indoor environment, Melissa is it with the interior design, so we can take the research and put it into practice. John, on the other hand, makes sure the things we can't see, you know, the CO2, the thermal comfort, the, the, the things in the carpet, all of those type of things that impact neurology and brain function, both from educators and students in terms of their ability to achieve, that's on him. So everything you don't see him, everything you do see is on her and Carrie has the luxury of making sure they're both doing what they need to do as the project manager. My job as a client leader is to make sure that they have all the resources of the DLR group at their disposal. So that means if we need an acoustician, we have them on staff. If we need a teacher through our bold services to talk to teachers, we have them on staff. If we need low voltage, a theater designer, whatever it might be, we have those on staff. It's a very short list of what we don't have, and that's the information we provided John, I think, last Tuesday in one of your very first questions. But everything else we have in-house, full service and in -house. So with that, that's who we are. And we're gonna try and clear, clean up and, and go through these three main points with you tonight. And they're gonna be embedded in just about everything we talk about. Now, what we did from a format structure is we took the six questions that you asked us, we're familiar with those, correct? And then your scoring matrix, which I think there's nine items on there. They're mostly in the shaded, other things we've accomplished and gone through prior. So we have kind of mashed those together. So we're gonna go question by question. And at the bottom of the slide or on the slide with the question, we'll use some keywords that we pulled out of your matrix scoring. So hopefully you can relate the six questions to the eight matrix scoring. Is that Sound fair? We're all good there? All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. So one of the first questions we asked us was, how do we as a firm uh, apply principles of equity? And then how does that translate into the services we provide to our clients? Um, DLR Group, is, uh, as we mentioned in our materials, is 100% employee-owned, 1,200-person uh, firm across the country. Um, and with being 100% employee-owned, it gives us a great opportunity to provide voice to the visioning process. 
Um, over the last year, we conducted a visioning plan for the next five years. We do that every five years. And one of the, the clear um, ideas that came out of it was a need to focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion within our firm. Um, since 2010, we've greatly improved the number of women and people of color in our firm. Uh, today, we, uh, uh, women make up 42% of our firm's design uh, team structure. Uh, and greatly enough, I can, I'm excited to say that our core K-12 team is actually 80% women-led. So um, it's, it's fabulous to be able to collaborate with many women across the firm. Um, and the n number of people of color in our firm has grown significantly since 2010 as well, up to about a quarter of the people in our firm. So what does that mean to you all? Well, internally, we have to believe and act in order to practice it, right, with our clients. We have to understand what EDI means internally. We have to believe it. We have to educate ourselves and stay on top of that, the, the discussions that are being had so that we can bring that to our clients. Um, and, and I'm not directing, sorry, to be directing. So part of how we do that is we bring design agency to the discussion. So design agency is the idea that everyone has the ability to act and transform the social change and be a positive forces in their community. In order to really look at uh, healthy communities, we use the um, social determinants of health framework from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Um, we know that it's important to have a balanced approach to a number of community resources in, in order for a community to truly thrive and have a high quality of, of living. So we apply that not only to planning, but we look at ways that we can uh, apply that in our projects, depending on what the project scope is. And you can see that education is an integral component to um, the structure as well. So next, I'm going to turn it over to both John. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, so a question you asked of us is, what lessons have we learned from the past year with COVID and how has that impacted learning environments in the future? So I wanted to take a step back and acknowledge that for many years, we've actually realized that through our research with Harvard, and our master plan work where we're putting out indoor air quality sensors that the space actually has a great impact on the students and the learning, be it their attention or their engagement. And so with the last year, it's actually highlighted that more so. Um, the amount of outdoor air for not just those learning, but also the safety and health of the people in the, the kids and the teachers in each space. So how we're using that is to right size equipment, make sure that we're actually providing the right amount of air. And we're doing that actually through a lot of monitoring as well, putting those sensors in the spaces, making sure that you know we're backing up actually what we preach. And how that affects actually the learning environment take chances they wouldn't be able to take to, uh, to learn from their successes and their failures and their problems. Um, can't say universally that that's been experience for everyone. And we have to acknowledge that uh, through this, this pandemic, we've also uh, identified areas where there's significant disparity in um, access to teaching and learning for the public. have not been in universe. Uh, we've learned this uh, firsthand uh, in Sacramento with our own family. 
how it was learned from our clients. And we've also learned it from the now near and far research group that we um, put out last week for the first time. Um, we interviewed uh, school districts across the country, uh, superintendents, principals, teachers, uh, students, and parents, asking them about how the, the touchpoint between the virtual and public learning has been. Um, we gained a lot of insight from this, and one of the relevant pieces is this uh, sort of disproportionate pie chart in the bottom about uh, what, was the, what was the positive features of the Southern Constitution. Uh, people felt positively about um, the increased technological confidence that they were suddenly in such places. There was also greater and enhanced communication, and there was also the work from home or the flexibility in the work environment and the uh, fluidity of the work environment that people can do. Um, anecdotally, we've also learned that from our, uh, our uh, client partners, we have um, adopted an inquiry-based learning framework um, that many of these teachers uh, are actually really proud of in an inquiry-based learning uh, method, and that they were actually able to adapt a little more seamlessly and a little more smoothly into a hybrid learning environment. And so you asked us to encourage independence, um, but what information is collected in the beginning of the project? We like to start the process off by um, what we call planning the plan, right? Really um, setting those goals, objectives, with the outcomes in mind, understanding what the end wants to be, and how we need to get, what we need to do to get there, and what decisions need to be made, who the key players are, what the timelines are, what the major milestones are and he to interact and be brought into the discussion along the way. Every project's different, right? We, we wouldn't do a, a mechanical retrofit project like you would do a, a full renovation project, right? There's different stakeholders involved in, in all of those um, decisions, but the idea is to bring them in, bring end users in and let them provide input, but also keep it open to that dialogue so that they understand at the end of the day What's, what's happening? What's happening with our project? And um, the level of transparency with stakeholders is often determined, you know, at, at this level or with administrative level. So we would work with you based on the, your level of transparency that's desired. Um, we also, um, with stakeholder participation, this is a pretty common structure where we work with primary users. We usually work with an administrative team to set those goals and objectives at the very start of the project. And then uh, the, you know, the Board of Education is the final decision makers with the community providing input in, in the process where it is and makes sense along the way. Uh, and Melissa is going to talk to us a little bit more how we collaborate um, with different groups and who we can do. So first, why, why collaborate, collaboration is the popular culture, of course, but this is an integral part of our process. And we truly want to uh, receive the input of all of these stakeholder groups um, to inform the, the goals and outcomes, um, as well as to develop a, 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 shared, a shared vision for what the project will be. Um, we also have to know this is your building. We want to hear all of these voices because this is your building at the end of the day. Uh, we want to facilitate um, consensus building activities that help all stakeholders uh, develop uh, shared ownership of the design process and the design solution at the end of the day. So in this process, we listen and we ask the right questions at the right time, which are often why more often than uh, what in the conversation. So we, we listen, we um, analyze what we've heard, we bring it back and we report out, we listen to the feedback and we integrate it back into the process. So it's an, it's an iterative circular process. Um, uh, oh, we, uh, to, to pick up the point, <laughs> we, so this is what I was looking for. It just changed the class. So we triangulate uh, this information, the, uh, the, the information from the district leadership, the collaborative voices from the various stakeholders, as well as the data that we know. Um, so this is 
industry-based research as well as our own internal research. The student engagement index, the teacher engagement index, which are proprietary, uh, which are available, are validated uh, research surveys that we have published, as well as the thin framework, uh, which is a research informed design process for K-12 design, and uh, thin stands for flexibility, individualization, methods, and nature of consideration, which were the four main components that we learned from the student engagement index that most influence our student engagement and the important The thin part is really cool because it was something where, you know, when you come in and talk to Jason, for example, you put something down on the table and then they immediately go to the back and they just do really research or propaganda. So we had to create this research and development team to be able to sift through all of that information to tell us really what is academic and what is propaganda. And that's what brought Melissa on and our research and development team to really start to go through and tell us what the research is and it lands on our hands. And to date, they've gone through, I think, over 160 articles and summarized it to make sure that when we do design, we do make those suggestions, that it is fact-based and purposeful. It's just not something to do because it looks good in a magazine. It actually has research, academic research behind it. One of the questions you asked us was, what have we learned from our experience where districts no longer use our architectural services? And I think we all know that political climate when you start embarking on projects of this or on a master plan, that you really need to have champions, and you need to have champions at all levels. The school board, at the cabinets, the administration, the teachers, the next lines up, the people in your community. And oftentimes the political climate sometimes changes up, where priorities change, the skin in the game has changed. There's been different reasons for different things like that. But one thing that we do know that makes successful projects successful and successful plans successful is that you got to have that champion that person that really still believes in the mission moving forward that has been developed from day one and that there is that horizon or that educational vision that you're working towards and making sure there's triggers and checkpoints so you can change your course dig out the compass and adjust but you have never lost the point on the horizon so you're always working towards something Again, that takes champion. How do we monitor districts' educational programs and services? I can tell you that this has really started to ramp up, particularly in the last couple of years, particularly with COVID. We, when you do a master plan or you move on to a project, you need to make sure that typically the master plan you need to update every five years or so. I would say that almost has to happen almost every year, if not every 18 months, because right now, we're tri still trying to figure out what the post-COVID is going to look like. As Melissa said, some districts are moved out of COVID 10 years ahead. Teachers are empowered because they've had to do things differently because of the COVID. We've had to practice things differently. And so that is empowering and let's keep leveraging that momentum forward and, and making sure that as we start going step by step, that we're not, we're pulling the compass out more often, more frequently because there is a, a situation where if a master plan says we need to do an addition here and an addition over here, a renovation here, in eight months, we could have redefined what going back to school looks like. It's just like everybody's trying to figure out what going back to work looks like. So we need to make sure that we're monitoring that and, and double checking to make sure and pulling out our compass to make sure that we readjust and hit those trigger points so we can leverage the opportunities to be more efficient. Because I think some districts right now are thinking we may not need all of the square footage that we have. We may only need about 80% of the students in high school, for instance. If you start going down the pathways, and maybe we can go over here and do centralized things, such as culinary arts, or tech, or make it more relevant where students are going out into the community versus bringing the community into the building the whole flipped classroom concept, where they learn a principle at night and come into a lab setting or an incubator type setting in the school. So those are the type of things that we need to keep our tabs on to monitor and reflect with those trigger points so that we're not just taking a straight line to that that marquee on the horizon without double checking. On the other side, we got some building 
healthy building. Well, in addition to what Dennis is talking about, keeping your budgets for building and construction and maintenance down, we also have some tools to help you with operations and, and maintenance on that end, where we'll commission your buildings, as Dennis mentioned, our team can do. Uh, we'll do monitoring base commissioning where we can tie into your building automation systems and pull out data and highlight times when things are not operating as they should, say an air handling unit operating all night. Well, that's wasted energy on your front. So we, we can highlight those things, bring them to your attention, help you fix those things. Um, and as Dennis alluded to on the healthy building side, we've actually developed a platform where we're monitoring that air quality, the temperature in the spaces, and we can create a dashboard similar to what you see here that'll highlight how those spaces are performing. And with that, we've also developed a, a handheld app for your phone that say a parent could log into and say, oh look, the building is actually safe. If, if the air quality is good for my children to go to that school. So those are things we've developed to help clients such as yourselves uh, advance your buildings. And uh, the last question you've asked is uh, internal processes for quality control and how to um, become a trusted ed build, uh, business advisor for you. Um, wanted to start that on the quality control, quality assurance front that our firm does. Each of our disciplines across the board, we get a third party review from an independent professional for each of those disciplines to look at the drawings at each phase of the project. So design development, 50% through construction documents. We send these off a couple of weeks before we issue them for the other professionals to take a look through, run through, make their comments so that everything's cleaned up, minimize changes needed when we actually issue to you, when we issue to bid, reduce addendum, change orders, what have you. Carrie will talk a little bit more on how we can yeah, so again, it's about going back to the outcomes in mind, right, and planning strategically when milestones are going to occur, who you're meeting with, and when you have to revisit with end users, right? We, we want to capture their feedback at the beginning, but we also want to keep end users that are part of the process um, informed throughout so that they understand at the end of the day what they might be walking into, right, and understand where professional development needs might uh, be necessary so that they know how to use their space, right? That's often a disconnect when you have an addition or renovation project, or even something as simple as new, simple as new furniture throughout a building, right? If you don't give them the tools to understand how to use it or what they can do with that furniture, then they often resort back to previous practices, right? So it's in giving them the information and the tools they need to be able to effectively use and, and, and move about their classrooms. Um, throughout the design process, as John mentioned, we have the, the check-in, we have different phase milestones, Oftentimes we're doing owner page turn reviews, walking through each of the, the sets of documents, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, fire protection, or basic architectural and interior plans, so that you as the owner are informed with what's in the document and you have an opportunity to say, well, you, we should look at that or can we incorporate this instead? Uh, and then that's usually during the process where we're doing uh, cost estimates and budget alignment. Right. So that's all working hand in hand. So at the end of the day, when it goes out for bid, the documents are, everybody understands what's in the documents are all, are all are on the same page. And that helps minimize those agenda and changes, as uh, um, John mentioned. It's also integral, not only for our team, but for your team to have continuity in team members, right? So that communication and continuity between teams on both sides is integral to making a project um, for me as a project manager, I absolutely want to have the people that are in design all the way through construction because they have developed that institutional knowledge of your district. They understand what's happening in, that, in the project. They understand what those outcomes and those initial goals or design principles are so that they are informing and making sure that they're staying on track for the process. And that's part of what my job is, is to make sure that they're aligning to those initial goals and outcomes that are established. At the end of the day, um, DOR group, we, 
we bring much to you in the in, in retail. We are not just a business partner. We are a trusted advisor. As Dennis mentioned, we have a number of services, almost all services in-house with the exception of some specialty services. Um, depending on the project we'll call in, those specialty services. We have experts all across the nation. Uh, we don't have one headquarters because we don't operate that way, right? We pull expertise from all across the country, wherever we need it, when we need it, so that we're bringing you a tailored design. Um, all of our design approaches are based on our particular client team, so we're bringing you the most value for, for your needs. Part of this question, I believe, was the business partner. DLR Group is, you know, relationship-based. We're here and want to be here for the long term. And we believe we're much more than just architects and engineers. Um, if it's Kerry working with FEMA to help find a $50 million grant to go along with her $17.25 million referendum, she's doing it. If we're following the infrastructure bill that was released and, and going through and figuring out how we can access those monies, uh, we're doing it. We have our federal group that's on top of that, knowing that most of those monies, if not 50% of those monies, need to be re reduced, released by May and in the ground by 2024. So I think there's a real opportunity there to work with our federal group to understand how we can access those monies and leverage that investment. Um, speaking of investment, we kind of see it as our job to look beyond the bricks and mortar and really turn your taxpayers into investors so that they see and understand that everything that you're putting in, into a project has a purpose. And that's because we think why first, then how, and then the what. The what part is the physical building. That becomes a very easy element when you start with the why, the how, the what. Most will think what, what do you want? Let's get it built. This is how we're gonna do it. But they don't think about why you need it in the first place. We put that conversation. And so, I think we want to be here. We want to be part of your, your community. Be long term. We're doing a lot of work up and down the Fox Valley River. Uh, Batavia, U46, the Barringtons, the Yorkville, et cetera, et cetera. Very similar in context to the Spear School District. And being able to leverage what they're thinking, not only here locally, but also what's going on around the country. Being able to bring in designers from around the country if we're thinking about CTE or additional pathways, um, those type of things. What's it, what does STEM look like in early childhood? What does an early childhood center look like? We can bring that science and expertise in the country to make the world a lot smaller. So just with that, I'll turn it over uh, to questions uh, that you may have. Now well, that concludes it. We're, we're uh, just kind of listening to uh, you guys. Oh, great. We want to hear you guys talk tonight. Excellent. So we Excellent. appreciate that. Excellent. So thanks for being patient with us tonight. And uh, we appreciate your time coming out here tonight and letting us get to know you. Perfect. Thank right. you. Thank Have you.
You ready? All right. Um, so our third present presentation tonight is by Wold. So um, we've allowed about 20 minutes for you guys to give your presentation. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and introduce your team and get started. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, we're thrilled to be here tonight um, as one of your finalists, and uh, we've really appreciated the opportunity to get to know the district and be a partner as we start the education facility planning process. And we would like nothing better than to continue that relationship with D203 as your architect of record. And Matt's going to tell me that he forgot to say engineer record too, but we do have engineers in the so I'm acknowledge it. Um, so, uh, tonight, we, uh, we've given you a, a sample of our uh, placemat. Uh, it kind of puts some key answers to the questions, but we're going to get more detail as we go through. And we'll also have a book to follow along. Um, it's the same information that would be up on the presentation. So um, we, this is a kind of a personal opportunity for me. As a community member, I've been able to have a front row seat to the educational facility planning process. And that's put me in the heart of a lot of great conversations with that team as we create a long-term playbook to recommend to the school district. So, but I'm not the only one that's uh, proud to be here tonight, and I'm not the only one that's committed from Wold to be uh, to make D 303 successful. So, I'll introduce myself, and I'll let my team introduce themselves too. But one thing I want to highlight is that these are the familiar faces that you are going to see day in and day out through our process. Um, we are not the marketing team that's going to ride off into the sunset after the interview. Um, we're here committed to the D303, and uh, um, we're going to be in the trenches we're be, when the work, hard work begins. These are the people that are going to be involved. And you've seen some of that exemplified through the facility planning process as well. So my name is Dan Critta. Uh, I think everybody knows me in some capacity. Um, I have been, I'm the historian of the group, if you can't tell, but uh, I've been with Wold for 32 years, and that's been focused on K-12 education throughout that time. And I just enjoy bringing uh, the visions of my school district clients to life. I'm Allison Andrews, uh, an educational programmer with Wolves. Uh, I've been alongside Dan through our educational alignment assessment, as well as the CAC meetings for the long range um, planning, master planning facility. Um, and I, as a kind of educational I'm just really excited about the opportunity to continue our work engaging with your stakeholders as the district continues to look for ways to improve their educational environments. I'm Jessalyn Kelly. I'm the project manager. Uh, in my tenure at Wold, I've worked exclusively in education environments, so it's something I really enjoy doing, and uh, I love seeing both the process of getting uh, teachers and st students excited about their spaces and then seeing the end product. Um, excited to break ground on the Compass Academy Improvements Project here in a couple weeks. Uh, good evening, I'm Mike Eichhorn, and I will be your educational planner. Um, I'm a new face to the district, um, but I'm really here to provide that new set of eyes and new, new perspective as you bring innovation forward. Um, I've been uh, working with school districts around Illinois for over 20 years, helping them plan and transform their schools. And I'm excited about you know getting on, on your team and assisting you as you uh, create spaces for students to learn and to thrive and really to prepare them uh, for the future. So thank you again. And I'm Matt Verdon, mechanical engineer, as Dan alluded to. Uh, so I'm charged with really getting to know your building systems and uh, find ways to, to not only provide a healthy environment, but also save you some money. Again, this is a team that you'll be uh, working with from day in and day out. Um, just some quick bullets I want to share with you. Um, most of this information is provided, but uh, just an overview of old 52 years in business. Uh, we're working with, actively with 150 plus school districts currently. Uh, we have in-house engineers, mechanically and electrically. It creates a very seamless delivery of our services to our clients. Um, over 300 staff, which allows us to have that kind of volume of work. And offices in four states, and why that's important is it allows us to bring some of the lessons that we've learned or sh share those lessons from outside of the Illinois uh, boundaries because um, there might be something relevant that's being discussed somewhere else that can really apply to D303. Footnote is we've, uh, as of last year, we're number seven in the nation in the PK-12 design. So we're going to get into your questions. 
How do you apply principles of equity within your organization and the services you provide to school districts? So to start off this question, we just wanted to let you know that um, Wool takes places very high value on the conversation of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, we actually have a committee that is of that exact name, um, EDI all for short. Um, but we also have a Women in Design Committee as well, or WID. Um, and those two is, have been a, it's a great platform for us to connect all four of those offices and our entire staff um, to come together for group discussions, uh, special events that just allows us to uh, kind of a, a tool to, for self-reflection as well as that continued improvement, um, both at a personal level as well as culturally. Um, one of the more recent events that I was able to take part in was actually through our WID committee. Um, we had a teacher from Caneland High School reach out to us. Uh, he had made comment that he actually had a higher percentage of females in his kind of drafting and CAD classes than he typically has seen in past years and reached out to see if we, um, a few of the women from our office would actually come and, well, virtually, and present um, to them sort of our different career path of how we got to where we are today. And then to share a little bit more about the field and what it is, you know, the design process for architecture and engineering. So it's a really great thing to be a part of. Um, our EDI committee is actually currently reaching out to other clients of ours to do a similar presentation um, from all of our different offices, just as a, a way of educating students um, and kind of doing that reach out. Um, our, our purpose statement is to make a, a difference in the communities that we serve. And I do feel very strongly that, that the possibilities in order to achieve that go well beyond design solutions. So having those communities has been a great vehicle for that conversation. So our culture of being equity-minded um, has really prepared us to be a, a better partner for our school district clients. And that's really our bridge from our services or our, our internal uh, values to bring those services to, the, to our school district clients. Um, we know that every learner is unique, every learner is different, and we want them to find those superpowers in the school district, in the school environment. Um, we also understand that we have to provide this, the environments to allow those super strengths to blossom. So um, what part of what, what we're, we're focused on is that empowerment piece. We know that by giving students choice and creating environments that they can choose how they're gonna learn that day and really choose to learn on their own terms, that those, those students are becoming empowered. We also have Fundamentally, part of our process and design is inclusion. We include all the voices we can at the table. And what's important to us for that is those diverse perspectives allow us to have a better solution. When we can hear from all the different sides of the table, we really understand that that's going to give us the best solution. It's also going to build ownership in that solution, so there's no surprises when the end result is. Um, this is a diagram or an image that the learning and teaching team shared with the Educational Facility Planning Committee. Um, it's very compelling and it's tied directly to your strategic commitment of innovative learning. But what I think is important about this is it's, it's a value that we share as well as removing barriers. We want to make sure that through our design process, we're removing barriers just as it's as showcased in the, in the justice scenario of this, this diagram. Um, if we can remove the barriers and make those accommodations without special supports, we're getting closer to that student agency. And we know student agency is part and parcel to a blended learning program, which the high schools have, have launched. We've also had some great conversations at the facility planning committee level about equity and understanding that uh, the learning experience is what we're striving for equity in. It's not necessarily that spaces need to be identical, and that's showcased in their need statement. You'll see that um, in their need statements that um, the same doesn't necessarily mean it's equity. So what lessons have we have you learned from the past year with COVID-19? How do you think the pandemic will impact learning environments in the future? Well, I feel like we've weathered the storm together. I mean, we started our process about a year and a half ago of facility planning, facility assessment. And at the pandemic struck about the midst of us getting through buildings, making observations, documenting conditions, but also our conversations with the principals and the building leadership teams. So we've really taken this in stride and we got through that process and forged ahead being very collaborative with the district, but also adapting our processes to meet a different timeline. Another piece of what we've learned in this process is that uh, we need to find ways 
uh, to add value in a different environment. Uh, we saw the determination of the D303 as you plan to bring schools back, uh, students back safely last fall. And we had to ask ourselves, how can we help? How can we make this a less anxious experience for our client? Um, we ended up getting involved with doing COVID capacity plans where we did socially distanced plans for the typical spaces throughout all the schools. So you had a, a gauge or a platform to understand how many kids can fit in the building under a hybrid model. So we're always looking for those ways of how can we help our clients take away some of the stress in these, these type of times. Another thing we learned last year, uh, more construction related, is that construction schedules are very vulnerable uh, during a pandemic. And uh, we saw lead times that, of things that you couldn't have predicted really put uh, cr critical pass in jeopardy on construction projects. So how we've addressed that this year is we're we'll much more creative about what kind of materials do we know are going to be deterrents to keep a schedule on track and avoid those in our construction projects. So we've had the chance this year now to, to respond to that and going into this next summer here, we should see much less of those kind of hiccups or those kind of obstacles for our construction trades team. So what's possible as we look forward? Um, we, only, we really know what's worked. We can ne can't necessarily predict with our crystal ball what's going to work, let's say, five, ten years from now. But we know what sticks. And over the last year or so, COVID has really accelerated the use of the virtual learning environment. And um, with that, we really feel like there's going to be, we believe there's three drivers of design the hybrid classroom. The hybrid classroom has really opened up possibilities for uh, the way education is delivered from a physical point of view too. Um, if you think about that from a virtual point of view, students, there may be less students in the school because they're learning remote. And as the, that affords more space, opens up space and allows you to take advantage of this extra space for programs like the blended learning program and, and bring that um, learning out Spaces, is not just in the classroom. Um, it also, um, the, the second point, the second driver is technology uh, and seamlessly in integrating it. It's really been pushed to the limit here over the last year with COVID. And so your tech team has actually come forward to us and given given some tips to the long range planning team. You know, that the technology should be un untethered, that the uh, sound and, and, and microphone systems in the classroom need to be advanced. So students that are in the virtual learning environment feel equal and are learning in the same way. And so we have some examples too that we have to move forward uh, how that does transform the students. And then lastly, making sure we have a healthy environment for the students that are in person. Uh, there's a few things that are just kind of no-brainer, low-cost uh, strategies that we've learned over the past year that can be implemented in just about any project. Some of those are uh, obviously making sure that We've got fresh air, right? Making sure that uh, the filters, we were designing systems with filters that need a remove readiness from the CDC guidelines. Um, making sure that if we're putting in any kind of systems like both bipolar or ionization or uh, any kind of UV lights, you, even if you don't put them into your systems, at least make sure that the systems are designed to have a natural thing to happen. As far as ventilation goes, um, just putting in a strategy into your building automation system that allows the facility manager to do like a, a building flush at the end of the school day. Just hit a button and let the thing purge the air out of the building. Make sure the building maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes. So you dump all the any contaminants in that space. Uh, also, if you've got any kind of uh, rooms, you know, they say identify a space that could be in isolation. Make sure that it's negative pressure while well you adjacent spaces. And then if you've got anyone that's sick, uh, you can get them to that space and they can stay there until they get cancer and they get them and get them safely. So just kind of some smart stuff like that that really are no cost impact that I'd like to at least plan for a pandemic. Yep. So your third question was uh, about information that we would collect and consider at the beginning of a project um, with, or any district. Um, so our process to start off a project would look very similar to how we began the master planning process. So we want to start with the facts. Um, now we have a great value of that in the last year and a half, we've been able to work alongside you um, and your community, and your staff, to kind of get a good hold on the givens within the facilities. Uh, we feel that we have a, a good pulse on where 
the opportunities exist at your different um, school buildings, as well as the challenges that you're facing. Uh, so I think that's a great jumping off point. Um, however, I would also say that when we're starting off a project, we want to look beyond what we can see. And to do that is having meaningful conversations with leadership and staff and students at those different facilities um, to go beyond you know, those conditions. And um, Jocelyn's going to talk a little bit more about the, the different layers of how that so as we get into a project, um, we, we kind of have the expectations established just kind of from a, a budget and timeline uh, perspective, but really we start to look at uh, kind of a, a multi-level or multi-layer approach to how this gets designed. So every phase of design gets a little bit more detailed. Um, and at the initial phase, the schematic design phase, we start with a steering committee and they're uh, involved throughout the whole process. Uh, and, and really it's to establish the framework uh, to measure the, the design against. So to make sure that we're aligned with the district's uh, vision and goals moving forward. And then moving into the core planning group, um, we can we can really start to look at what are the unique solutions for this building? And then looking at uh, the user group input a little bit later, just it's really, really down into the detail. And then taking a look at specifically the core planning group process. So this is kind of where the bulk of the conversation happens. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about stakeholders and including all voices at the table. That includes students, staff, admin, uh, community members. If you have uh, other entities in the community that are sharing your space, uh, much like the, the library is uh, using the space at Haynes right now, we start to include those voices at the table early to make sure that we're accounting for all of the district's needs. Um, and then they're charged with creating the, the principles and criteria to measure the design against. And that helps us create that initial design solution. And that's really uh, kind of a circular process. Go back and forth a little bit. It's all about that collaboration with the group, finally terminating in a, at a facility recommendation to move into the next step of the design process. We want to showcase a process, very inclusive process that uh, really is unique to Wold. And uh, as Justin talked about that, that inclusion of having students at the table, this showcases that uh, it's called Innovation Day. Um, it's something that we do for projects or for more master planning efforts. But uh, um, we want to just let, give you a sense. It's, a, it's an ability for students, uh, teachers, and parents to come to the table and reimagine some of the spaces that they're using in their building. So it's very project-based, hands-on, and it's a great guide for us as we start launching projects. So, It's the first video that I wasn't left in the editing room floor there, so I had to get at least that far. Um, we could imagine this kind of a forum being a, a, a great guide. I know LRC transformations, it was a theme through across all the buildings in our long range planning process. Um, something like this would be a great way to gather that, reimagine those spaces and do it at a very inclusive level. 
So what have you learned from past experience of districts who decided to no longer use your architectural services? Well, the answer to this question is partly embedded in the question. Uh, you stated, use your architectural services. The last thing we want to be is a service provider or a vendor. We, our goal is to build a long-term collaborative relationship with our clients. And that's the way we build longevity. So when we, when we talk about uh, the use of our services, we know, and I'll footnote this answer is, it's very rare for us to lose a client. But we know we're most vulnerable when there's a transition of leadership, when an organization is somebody exiting or leaving the organization that we might have had the, the strongest bind to. So we understand that and we have to protect ourselves. That One of the lessons we've learned, and Allison will share a second, is we don't want to be a pair of hands. We don't want to come in and do the, the district business. We're not adding any value. So we want to make sure that we're, we're providing value. We want to make sure that we're not coming in on the flip side as an expert. Coming in as an expert without that connection to your community, which we've been building over the last year and a half, um, puts that person in a silo and doesn't really add value from their perspective either. So a collaborative relationship, a partnership with our clients is how we prevent um, losing them. So quickly, as Dan sort of alluded to, is those transitions where we, we do see ourselves as the most vulnerable. So part of the way that we, we work against that is um, to establish those partnerships at multiple levels uh, within B303. So by building value um, with multiple stakeholders, that way, we can, you know, well weather any of those potential um, departures or transitions as they occur, because it's a, it's a challenge that's going to, it's inevitable as folks retire and go on to other things. Um, but the added value of having those multi-tiered relationships at a, at a strong level is that going back to what Justin was talking about, ensuring that all voices are heard, that throughout the process as we transition from phase to phase, um, those connections and those relationships that we built at those various lower, um, levels, those voices aren't lost as we move through the process. Describe the process you used to continuously monitor efficiencies in school district facilities, programs, services, and help you control costs. So obviously when we talk about efficiency, we think about mechanical systems, right? How can we save some money? Um, one of the things that we really like to do when we start with a client is that we want to get to know them. We want to understand uh, where their values are, what are the, what, are, what is your buildings using utility-wise, what, uh, what systems are your, your facilities guys familiar with, are they comfortable maintaining, how to operate those buildings. And we've got software packages that we can take some of that information to put into and then quickly do some, uh, some pretty fast analysis to find out what kind of payback we're going to get from that and then compare that to what kind of funding is available, whether it's grants or utility rebate programs, things like that. Uh, so really can we get, can we get a good look at a return on investment uh, and find a way that it's going to obviously benefit the not just from an environmental standpoint, but also from the So looking at space itself and looking how we can optimally use it, we have a couple different toolkits that we use. And one of them actually we've already done with your district, which is the educational alignment study which looks room by room. And is there is that space being used what it was designed for? Is there spaces you be used from a multi-purpose point of view or is it only used for one period of day? And so that's the, that's kind of a snapshot of where you are today. As you project that out in the future, we have a 10-year plan where year to year, we start to be good stewards of your money and do those projects year to year in a, in a kind of a good sequence to, to optimize the, um, the dollars. Um, we also do... Um, uh, where we will um, do like a pilot program. So when you look at a space and before you buy furniture, for example, we'll look at what type of furniture will optimally work within that classroom so you don't have too much and you don't have too little. And so we'll do a, a, a pilot that will last for about a year and the teachers get to use it, they get to swap things out. And so we find that that is also very, very useful. Um, there's also post-occupancy studies. So after a space is, is built, go in and see if it's being used correctly. Are the instructors using it correctly? Do we need to have them do professional development to know how to use it? And so those are things that we can help you with. And again, to optimize the space so you're not building too much and you're not building too little. And this image is just an example of a personalized learning center that 
um, took all took those things in mind and looked to uh, maximize and uh, capitalize on that space utilization, um, where this can be reconfigured for small groups of say three students all the way up to a co-teaching scenario of 90 plus students using that diverse um, and flexible furniture so it meets the different needs on any given day or for that particular um, lesson. Um, so just as an example of how we took those lessons. So what, what internal process do you use for quality control and communication with the district prior to releasing specifications for a project? How does this process change once the project begins? Just kicking this off, uh, a signature of quality control is repeat business. And uh, in the last two years, we've done over 500 educational projects valued at over $1.6 billion. So we had the evidence that uh, we have a process that works for quality control and communication. So I think uh, a couple of things that we find to be some key differentiators for us. Um, we do a process called that user input process. And I think uh, we touched on that a little bit earlier and I'll get a little bit more in detail here. But another uh, piece that we really value is our third party estimating. So that's included in our fee. It's a standard uh, service for us, but we really find that that keeps us um, aligned with what's happening in the market. Uh, and it keeps us honest about what, what timing uh, we're looking at for bidding and things like that. Uh, another thing we have is our uh, peer review. Uh, we, we send out our drawings internally to our in-house experts uh, in K-12 uh, specialties and make sure that there's nothing we've missed. Uh, and then we'll take the documents and we'll do a page turn with you and, and the group to make sure that we've hit scope and that we've captured a lot of, or all of what we've talked about so far. So then uh, taking a look at what that process looks like uh, lined up is uh, a timeline of communication. Uh, so really taking a look at when we come back to you as the board so that you understand what's happening in your project. We understand that uh, the day-to-day -day information happens uh, fast and furious with, with your teams, but we do play that information back to you. So this is just a representation of all of the inputs, the, the key milestone inputs we get and when, when and how we play those back. And then uh, taking a look at that user group input, uh, really it just, it allows us to build that coordination document so that we have the same expectations between our conversations with your teams and your staff, um, all the way to our engineers. So I will take that document that tells us uh, what equipment you're planning to use in the space. Uh, we, we recently did this with your Compass Academy project. You know, we took the list of equipment that you're planning and we turned it right over in a drawing form to our consultants to make sure that we had all of the right electrical planning and mechanical planning that we needed to do for that. Uh, it really avoids surprises on move-in day and it really keeps the, the conduit of information seamless between, in that case, Matt and I, especially. If you take anything away from our process for the design, the design side, it's that we're gonna communicate pretty regularly. And, and the important thing is once we go into construction, that's not going to change. Whether it's through weekly construction meetings or it's owner meetings, owner architect contractor meetings, meeting with the board, or the committees, or the board meetings, um, the same people you're seeing here are the same people as part of the design process, and the same people as part of construction. So the same, all of that information that we're learning through all those steps is going to be, we're going to make sure that it's translated into construction. We're there to be an advocate for you. We're there to make sure that. All of those goals and all those criteria that we've spent months developing is going to be coming appropriately and every dollars are being spent on. And speaking of dollars, uh, if you look at our change order history, we've got a pretty pretty solid track record, track record there. Um, on new construction, we're regularly under 1%, and we're under 3% on renovations. Uh, that is by far beyond what the uh, industry standard is. We got through the questions. I know it was fast. Uh, please answer, ask more. Um, but just quickly, why Wold? We know D303. We share your values. We've been in the trenches. We've been with the facility planning process, and we've learned a lot together over the last year. Um, we don't. No one else listens like we do. Um, we pride ourselves on an inclusive process at every level to make sure all those voices have a chance to be heard. Uh, concerning the big picture, I mean, the, the facility planning process is the big picture that we're working through right now with that committee, um, and we can share lessons that we're learning from other districts or other places might help inform that process. And I'd say we're, we're uniquely committed because um, I'm personally invested in the district as a member of the community. Um, 
my team obviously is dedicated to E303, but I, I have an investment that, that of pride that I'm part of this district and I certainly don't want to see it fail at any level. Um, and then focus on the customer experience. We know that our competition can all design the shiny object, but what's the path feel like getting there? And that customer experience is what we pride ourselves on. We can deliver the shiny object, but we definitely want to make sure that the ride there was enjoyable. And I think that's a big differentiator between us and our competition. So I'll turn it over to questions. If we have two minutes to the end, we do have a quick video that just shows one more tool on how we, we explain design. It's a, it's a quick uh, walkthrough of the building. But uh, if there's time, we'll, uh, we'll plug that in. Yeah, if you want to go ahead um, and show that, we're not really asking questions. We just, our uh, goal tonight was to listen to everybody and take that information. So if you want to show that, and then sure. you guys can. Uh... Yeah, I'll kind of semi narrate it and then uh, give questions about this. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a, a project that is uh, almost complete in construction. It's uh, McHenry West Campus. It's a science, uh, technology, and industry addition. So it's about a 48,000 square foot addition. Um, this is a tool that we use. It's a virtual walkthrough, basically. So about midway through design, we offer this up to our clients to make sure that they understand what they're getting. Uh, more design occurred certainly after this, but this was a snapshot at that stage, about 50% through the final design, um, to really give people a, a, an idea of what do those spaces feel like? What are we missing? Um, you saw that there's an incubator lab, advanced engineering. It's a very CTE-based environment at this level. Uh, the background there, this is a learning ledge that uh, overlooks the advanced manufacturing. They're gonna have CNC machines and things like that that are on display. So you get a lot of that glimpses of what kids are doing in that interaction. So kids get excited about uh, what's happening. On the second level, it's dedicated more to science. There's a biomed room, there's an advanced, uh, another advanced engineering, I'm sorry, advanced science classroom. And then there's your more standard science classrooms with the shared lab and two flanking classrooms. You see in the hallway, what was typically a hallway, um, is an extended learning environment. They have glass panels that overlook that space so kids can go out there and still be supervised. But in a security situation, there's a panel, a, a marker board that slides over those walls so you have discretion looking into those rooms. Feels like a collegiate kind of space. There's a couple of fishbowl conference rooms there. Um, the way we walk folks through this thing to understand this is we'll actually put the Oculus goggles on and let them take the tour. Now, we, it's not for the, for maybe for the, uh, the non-roller coaster riders because it is a little bit of a, a, a ride through here, but um, um, with the Oculus on, you can actually do all the turning and, and looking and viewing um, to whatever direction you want. So this model lets us do that, but we did a quick snapshot just to give you a sense of another tool in our kit to help you explain the design process. And then this is a, actually a photograph of that top floor where those fish poles are. They're building this floor, building this building based from the top down. So the top two floors are finished. The third floor, which is more CTE based, it'll be online come uh, the first of the school year. So they're already using that students are excited they've been in this space, but this is an actual shot of that uh, learning environment. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you again for uh, your patience tonight. Um, and thanks again for your team for coming and presenting to us. Absolutely. All right, thank thanks you. Thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it very much. So board members, if you want to take a few moments to kind of go through your uh, matrices and fill those out, and then we'll hand them to Ms. Barker, and then she'll kind of tabulate um, our responses. And we'll go from there. Can you make sure that you put a one, two, or three as your final decision? Yes, thank you. And maybe your initials would help too.
last week. Yeah, so I had um, staff just put together individual ones so that we could mark them up and everything. So if you have that, you can use that. Otherwise, you can just. Um, Yes, we are. Yep.
Okay. I move that the school board rank the three firms in order from first to last choice as follows. Number one, Wold. Number two, DLR. Number three, FGMA. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. McCabe, thank you. Take the roll, please. Mrs. Fairgrave? Yes. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Uh, Mr. Manheim? Yes. Motion passes. Um, with that being said, Dr. Pearson, um, will you work on negotiating uh, with World Architects and bring that forward to the board for a future um, action? Yes, we will get that together for you. Thank Excellent. You. All right, thank you. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mr. Second. McCabe, Mr. McNally. Um, sorry if you take the roll, please. Mr. Lackner? Yes. Mrs. McCabe? Yes. Mr. McNally? Yes. Mrs. Barker? Yes. Mrs. Fairgrave? Yes. Mr. Manhart? Yes. We are adjourned at 10.